in 30. Okay, good morning members to the weekly committee meeting um, and to Patsy and Claire who are, um, Morris, who are online with us here this morning and Philip, Rosemary and Harry who have joined us in person. Um, the, the meeting will include briefings. Today will include briefings from the, de the Department on the Environment and Green Growth Strategies, consideration of a number of SL funds in SA. Uh, I say Claire, uh, Morris and Pat are online and um, are we expecting John? About quarter past, yeah. Jo John will be joining us now in, uh, in five minutes as well. Um, Okay. Uh, and as we know, the committee meeting will be brought, recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament buildings and online. And you can use your mobile devices provided there in airplane mode. We don't have any apologies. And um, the next item on the agenda is the, um, the draft minutes which of the meeting held last week, pages 5 to 12. Are, are members okay that I sign off on last week's minutes? Yep. Okay. Um, if there's any uh, matters arising, um, members will recall that it had been agreed that the um, members will recall it agreed that the deputy chair and myself would meet the convener and deputy convener of the Scottish Parliament. For Culture, Tourism, Europe and External Affairs. But I, the meeting is connection with the ports and what happens on the 1st of January. Its focus uh, is on an exchange of information. That, that virtual meeting is now confirmed for Thursday, the 19th of November at 3pm via Microsoft Teams. At this point, it is only the Scottish Convener and Deputy Convener who are attending. If any members of this committee wishes to attend, they should let Stella know by close of play today uh, to allow the meeting to be organised. To organise. So, um, if, if you prefer to make it, that would be that would be great. And even if you can't, we will be providing a full report back to the committee. It's Thursday, um, uh, 30, Thursday, the 18th of November, Rosemary, this day week, uh, at 3 p.m. Uh, via Microsoft Teams. <coughs> so, uh, <coughs> if you, uh, also, if you can, uh, depending on uh, if the meeting here finishes in reasonable time, you might be back in the consistency to do it, or else. Um, May have to do it from part of the buildings, whatever, whatever suits. But uh, be, be grateful uh, if you could um, try your best. So item number four, uh, we're going to have an oral briefing uh, from the uh, department on the environment strategy and green growth. Uh, we will receive the briefing um, followed by uh, questions from from members. Uh, then officials will present on the green growth strategy. I want to refer to the following documents: a memo from. Stella on the Environment Strategy, page 16 to 18. Correspondence from the Department, 18 to 20. Summary of the responses to the document on pages 21 to 56. Memo from the Clerk at 57 to 60. Correspondence from the Department, 61 to 7, 61 to 67. And an or the oral statement uh, by the Minister on the Green Growth Strategy and Delivery Framework at page 68 to 81. I'd like to take uh, this juncture, I'd like to welcome uh, via Starleaf. Uh, David Small, Debbie Secretary, Simon Webb, Head of Neighbourhood Environmental Quality, Fishy Tate, Director of Resource Efficiency Division, and Aaron Wright, Acting Director of Green Growth. And I'd like to invite you to commence the briefing, and then this will be followed by questions from the members. Okay. Thank you. You're very welcome this morning. Yeah, we can hear you loud and clear. Uh, can, can Patsy and Claire Morris, can you hear okay? Can you they're muted, I think, at this stage. Sorry? They're muted. Oh, I, oh sorry, they're muted. Yeah, okay. Yeah, <coughs> let's get on, David. We can hear you fine. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, well, look, first of all, I appreciate the opportunity to meet with the committee um, to discuss the environment strategies for Northern Ireland. Um, the focus of our briefing this morning is to discuss the findings of the public discussion exercise on the proposed strategy uh, as opposed to the detail content of the strategy itself and that still has to be developed um, but to set this in context i'll just take the opportunity to give the committee a bit of background on the strategy and how we have got to where we are now um, northern Ireland faces many challenges such as climate change 
waste management, uh, the development of the circular economy, waste crime, air quality, local environment quality, biodiversity loss and soil quality. And there are specific issues associated with agricultural activity, such as agricultural greenhouse gas emissions, the effect of nitrogen runoff and phosphorus on water quality, and the impact of ammonia emissions on our air quality and designated sites and priority species. So it's a very busy area. Um, challenges, um, along with the additional environmental opportunities arising from our withdrawal from the EU, and the publication of the UK government's 25-year plan for the environment create a strong impetus for the first long-term environment strategy for Northern Ireland, which will form part of uh, the Green Growth Framework you'll hear more about shortly from Tracy and Aaron. The UK Government Bill contains provisions which, if enacted by the Assembly, will require the Department to prepare an environmental improvement plan and accompany and works to assess progress. If the Environment Strategy is adopted as Northern Ireland's first environmental improvement plan under the Environment Bill, that will give the strategy uh, a legal underpinning. Whilst no decisions have been made on this yet, the Minister will be engaging with executive colleagues on the possibility uh, at an appropriate point. The Department launched a public discussion document on a future environment strategy in September 2019 last year. To seek the widest possible range of views, it was based on a series of high-level questions which provided the public and stakeholders with an opportunity to shape the strategy in advance of drafting work uh, commencing. The public discussion closed on the 5th of February 2020, with 2,500 responses received from across Northern Ireland, reflecting the views of a wide range of respondents, including young people. And we made particular efforts to reach young people because we thought that was important. Working with NISRA colleagues, a summary report was produced, and that I think has been copied to the committee. The Minister has not given his agreement to begin drafting the strategy, using the key findings of the report to help inform content. The Environment Strategy team will be seeking input to the strategy from business units across DERA, from other departments on a wide range of issues, and from key stakeholders uh, in the coming months. As with subjects like energy, economy, and transport, the Environment Strategy is one of the main strategies underpinning the executive's overarching green growth strategy and delivery framework. And while other sister strategies will contribute more to the green growth aim regarding net zero carbon and sustainable economic growth, the environment strategy will provide the focus for protecting and enhancing the wider environment. Chair, that's really all I intend to say by way of background, uh, but Simon Webb and I will be very happy to take questions from, from members. Okay, uh, th thank you for that there. Um, just to um, ask you there, uh, David, um, do you see, um, you, you say you, you had a public, there's a public consultation from uh, September to February, and, and that, that's a, a huge number of responses, uh, and that's, that's, th those are very welcome. Is there another consultation plan again in March 2021? Uh, lots of consultations, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, we we are about to start one, for example, on air quality. Um, there will be consultation next year on a range of UK-wide initiatives around uh, a deposit return scheme, for example, to try and address plastics. Um, when 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 we have advanced the work on strategy a bit further, um, there will be a further consultation on the strat on a draft strategy itself, which will then at that point include detailed proposals and strategic goals and strategic aims, setting out the ambition. For the, for the strategy, there will be further consultation at, at that point, and it's, it's likely to be toward, yeah, toward, towards the end of, of this um, business year, which will take us into probably March or April time. Um, Rosemary? Yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for your introduction there. This is a very wide-ranging strategy, and um, I, assume, I assume DERA will narrow it down into priorities and individual work plans with estimated timescales, when do you envisage us to see something like that? So it was important through the discussion process that, that we, we set out all of the issues and all of the challenges that we face around the environment in Northern Ireland. Um, and, and that process was very 
example, 91% of respondents agreed that the new strategy, for example, should be an executive endorsed strategy. They want the strategy to be a top priority for Northern Ireland um, and, and to be a central pillar at the heart of other government strategies. But you know the dominant themes that were coming out from that process included things like climate change, which would be no surprise, recycling, air quality, water quality, biodiversity, plastics, all very topical issues at the moment. Um, I suppose the, the, the key dominant theme is the need to protect the natural environment. But climate change was a very strong, uh, a strong, strong theme. So we, we will now start the process of, of you know, re reviewing all of those of those comments in detail, reviewing the evidence, where the challenges are, and begin to set out uh, in, in, in a more stru structured, focused way uh, what, what our ambition would be across those various issues. And that, that work is now starting. Um, and as I say, we'll be work, work, working on that to bring us to a point where we can then present a draft strategy which sets out a range of specific proposals. So, so the Minister then will have the final say in relation to how you proceed? Yeah, we'll be very grateful to the Minister. This will be um, you know, a strategy developed by DERA. As I say, 91% of respondents agreed that strategy should be an executive endorsed strategy, which, which the executive will, will want to endorse it. Uh, but We'll, we'll be leading all of that work uh, um, and le you know, leading it with. with the, the okay, thank you. Uh, Claire? Claire? Can you hear me? Chair, yep, yeah. cheers. Um, thanks for that. I mean, I have to say, I agree with Rosemary that it's a very wide ranging strategy, but it's also um, it's wide ranging and very non specific, I suppose, it is what I was looking at and does focus heavily on um, carbon being the main sort of focus of that. But, you know, as you outlined at the start, David, there, there's, um, you know, the whole raft of measures that need to be acted on. Um, and you're talking about the agri sector, climate change, air quality, water quality. So I'm wondering, um, and I'm looking at the element of public participation within this. Um, so people have made their views um, clearly known in this response, but what other options will be explored for public participation? Uh, well, as you know, we're, we're working uh, through the, the, the vehicle of the Environment Bill at the moment um, around, um, around the, the government issue and, and governance, strong governance arrangements came out again as a very strong theme from the public discussion, um, as did the importance of education and awareness behaviour. So, so we recognise that governance is important, um, and you know we we, we we will be with subject to the executive's approval, um, joint, joining in, in the the Office of Environmental Protection and, and its role in terms of challenging government department <coughs> public authorities in terms of meeting their environmental obligations, and, and we we will be we will be providing comment and, and thoughts on that within the the strategy document. But as I say, that, that you know that process is now only now starting, Claire. Um, the discussion process was wide ranging because we want we wanted to get as 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 wide um, uh, and broad a range of comments that that, that we could from uh, from the people you know we were going out to. Um, and as I said, we, we got over we got two and a half thousand responses. It, it was successful in, in in that respect. But we now need to focus in on what the key issues are, what the key themes. And will be, and what the strategic goals will be within the strategy. That that will be, we'll be engaging with colleagues within the department, with other departments and wider stakeholders as we as we take that process forward. And that will then, um, you know, we, with all of it, we will then begin to draft up the detail of a strategy document, which we would then consult on again. So there will there will be opportunities for views in terms of governance. And how environmental governance is managed, um, but we, we we will take account of the, the evidence and the information that we have at the minute and put uh, put our proposals together within the within the draft strategy document. 
Okay, thanks. And I ask that because there was um, large interest in the responses for public forums such as citizens assemblies, for example. But I'm also looking at how the going for growth strategy, which was the previous one that has run out, um, was managed and the sort of stakeholder engagement level within that. And that was heavily focused on um, sectoral and business interests rather than wider public participation. And so looking at the, the, the consultation that was put out um, being very wide, um, so two and a half thousand respondents. We're talking about public participation, setting up all these different bodies within it. The time frame and the timeline is undetermined, uh, and yet we know that these are very urgent issues. You know, so it's about marrying the speed of delivery and um, meeting our legal obligations, which we haven't been doing in a lot of areas. Um, and for example, you're mentioning an air quality strategy consultation coming out. You know, but you know, when did our last one run out? You know how long have we been without a strategy? Um, yeah. So I do have a lot of concerns just about who will be engaging, the timeline for delivery, um, and how we move forward on this one. I suppose, and again, it's very carbon focused, um, where we have also biodiversity emergency, we have species extinction, um, and we have all that damage. So that's not even been included really there, or non-specific, shall I say, rather than not yeah. included. But I, I suppose, I suppose, Claire, the, the discussion process wasn't meant to be specific. You know, so we, we, we deliberately didn't set out what we thought we should be doing. We were seeking views on the widest range of environmental challenges that we face. But we have, we've got a very, we've got very strong comments, themes coming through around climate change, as I say, dominant themes around strong governance being needed. Uh, agriculture features strongly as, as a key theme for the strategy in terms of concerns being expressed about the impact of agriculture and, as you say, on, on, on things like water quality and biodiversity. So the strategy will sit with, with those and set out, set out our, our goals and our ambition around how we address those issues. And you, you have rightly flagged up the issue of public participation. I agree that's important. Um, can I bring in Simon, Claire, just in terms of, of the, the the timetable ahead as to when we hope to have a you know a draft strategy that we would like to be and and be and just any further uh, public participation how citizens get involved Simon. yeah thank, thanks david um yes the the expectation is that uh, we would be publishing a draft strategy for an eight-week public consultation before the end of march um, that would take us up then till around about the end of May, um, and that would then allow uh, finalisation of the draft strategy by the autumn. So those are the sort of time scales we're working to. Now, in terms of engaging, um, in, indeed, one of the um, things with that we've identified within the strategy um, is environmental engagement. Um, that will actually be broadened out now to environmental engagement and education in light of the comments we've received through the discussion document. Um, so we have had already very extensive collaboration. We had a large stakeholder event last year, around 90 delegates with a number of youth events. Um, we've had the 2,500, as you say, responses via the discussion document. We'll have more public engagement then through the formal public consultation on the draft strategy. and. Uh, COVID permitting, we will have more uh, engagement events as well. Okay, well, one of just the last one, if I can then. Um, so agriculture and farming practices have been a big feature in this, um, in, the, in the response. And I'm looking ahead to the green growth strategy being developed as well. Um, so I'm wondering, you know, with the level of response and that issue being brought to the fore with this consultation, um, has that, um, affected any of the conversations or work being done in the department around a specific sustainable farming strategy um, for Northern Ireland? You know, we have, you know, historically, you know, provided the economic incentives for farming to do bad environmental practice, where we could flip that round, sustain sustainable farming by giving them economic incentives to do so. Um, so I'm wondering what the department or, or what the thinking is on that. Yeah, so look, as, as they occur, it's a very, very busy space at the minute. You've mentioned green growth, uh, and, and we need to work out how the green growth framework that, that Tracy will be talking about will merge and work alongside the environment strategy. We've got climate change and a whole range of challenges around climate change, and all of government being involved in that. 
Uh, we've also got future agriculture policy as we come out of CAF. You know, so we, we will be we'll, we'll be thinking carefully through what ag future agriculture policy should look like, how we can ensure that future agriculture policy, as well as as creating you know a, 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 a model that delivers good food and rewards farm, also delivers a model that delivers for the environment. So yeah, we, we, we are taking account of all of the issues that we're hearing. We're taking account of the evidence and the data that, that, that we can see because um, you know we're seeing signs that uh, phosphorus levels in rivers is, is increasing. Um, nitrogen levels in marine water, water bodies are increasing. We, you've mentioned biodiversity. We know that ammonia, for example, is having an impact on our biodiversity and habitats. So there, we're very aware points are I'm very aware of the need to begin to address those and the way to address those is to make agriculture more sustainable and uh, you know the minister has has put sustainability at the heart of the department's vision um, and I, I think going forward you know, he's very he, he is clear that that we want agriculture to deliver both good food but deliver good environmental outcomes I think we do recognize there are pressures and agriculture puts negative pressures on, on the environment, uh, we need to find ways, whether it's through research, different farming methods, different technology that we can use um, of making agriculture more sustainable. And we will be trying to build that into the future agri agriculture policy work that other colleagues in the department are taking forward. So we do we certainly recognize the challenges and we will be attempting to take all of that into account. Yeah, but recognizing the challenges that have been there for so long, you know, it's, it's the actions, it's delivery, you know, we don't have the time anymore and it's that's, the crucial but we do know we have the evidence we have the research we have the stats it's all there and it's been there a long time um so that's my point you know okay. and i think that this process is another long drawn out one. yeah Thank okay you. and hopefully the strategy will, you know when we begin to draft the strategy and um, what it is we're trying to achieve we'll we'll then be to put more color around what we need to do you know so for example on ammonia we we have developed a, a set of measures that will reduce ammonia emissions in northern ireland we're we're in discussion with the minister on that and we want to get that launched and there, you know we've got an environmental farming scheme that is beginning to deliver environmental improvement environmental outcomes we want more farmers to get involved in agri environment and, and to farm in, in, a, in a sustainable way um and, and there will be other other similar programs and measures where we support farmers in, in that We've just launched a uh, farm business improvement scheme, another tranche, again, supporting environmental measures, supporting low emission spreading technology. And, and so that, you know, there are a lot of actions that we are taking, but I think we recognize we need to continue that and do more. Uh, and the strategy gives us an opportunity to put a kind of framework around all of that. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, Patsy? Hatsi, you seem to be muted there. Yes. Yeah. You okay now? You're... Yeah, Patsy, we can hear you now, yes. Yeah, that's okay. Thanks very much, Chair. Thanks very much for everybody presenting. Um, I was just looking at the time frame there. Uh, the previous document was launched on the 18th of September last year, so we're, we're over a year on since that and I realise and recognise that there's been quite a bit of work done on it since then. So I, I note the time frame then for, just picking up on Claire's point, is for a, a strategy document to be available around about March time with another eight-week consultation period. Have you any projected period for an actual strategy, for implement, an implementation strategy? Uh, I'm not sure with, with, with you know, a, a specific date in mind, Patsy, but um, it, it, so we, we will go through the public consultation on the more detailed strategy proposals when, when, when all of that has been drafted up. Uh, and it's, it's important that, that we, we give time to the public consultation, but that will take us into the spring, late spring next year. At that stage, we would then be nailing down you know, what the strategy content will look like. And as I say, there, there, is, there is a desire, strong desire from the respondents that it should be an executive endorsed strategy. And if, if I agree with that, that in the department, if the minister agrees, then there will be another piece of work in terms of taking it to the executive and gaining executive support. Um, but I, my, my, my hope would be that next year we, we will have first ever environment strategy and setting out our ambitions to protect our environment 
and improve the environment and you know and, and the kind of issues that we'll be dealing with um can't give you an exact date but there, there will be work work ahead of us next year um and i optimistically i would hope we would have a, a first ever environment strategy in place by the end of next year just maybe following up from that um is there any benchmark by which you're going to develop it in other words a strategy in say some other part of these islands or uh, maybe European dynamics or whatever those might be. Uh, uh, in other words, we, I'm looking at this and uh, I'm saying, what what are your criteria for what would be an adequate strategy as opposed to something that could potentially be dumbed down to, to make it not as adequate as it could be? Yeah, well, as I say, the, the, the public consultation exercise will, will give the public an opportunity to, to say what they, they want the strategy to do and whether what we've drafted is, is appropriate and adequate. Uh, we will be looking at other regions, you know, so we're aware of the, the, the England 25-year environment plan. Uh, we'll be looking at what other regions in the UK are doing, what's happening in the south. So, yeah, we, we will look at, you know, at abroad and, and see what, what, what is being done. Some of the challenges we face in Northern Ireland are similar to the challenges elsewhere. Some are more unique in Northern Ireland. Uh, you know, we have very heavy reliance, for example, on agriculture, and some of the issues in agriculture are, are difficult to deal with. But... I think we, we will take account of all of that um, and we will seek to make the, the, the strategy ambitious and, and worth worth having because, you know, we will work on the strategy to meet something. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much for that. Well, okay, thanks, Chair. Okay, uh, Philip, Patrick. Thanks, uh, Chair. Uh, David, uh, maybe I misheard you, but I, I think you said that uh, you, you, you were working or looking at the opportunities uh, coming from the EU withdrawal, so I mean, I'd be quite interested to see what opportunities exist within the environment from EU withdrawal. Yeah, uh, sorry, I'm not sure what 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 what, uh, what I said or what the context was. I think I, I certainly mentioned the environment bill and that you know the 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 fact that we have sought to keep options open on the environment bill, so the assembly has the opportunity to pick up some of the provisions. And some of those provisions are, are, are specifically around future governance arrangements when we lose the governance of the EU. So an Office of Environmental Protection, for example, if the commit, if um, the Assembly agrees, we, we, then, we then operate within Northern Ireland. And, and that, that is specifically to, to fill the, the, the governance vacuum that we'll have when we leave the, the EU, and we come out of, when we come out of transition. But there will be opportunities, you know, some 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 of some areas of environment we will still be locked into some EU requirements on under Annex Two of the Pro, Northern Ireland Protocol, but there will be other environmental areas where we will have a bit more a bit more freedom to do things potentially differently. Trying trying to keep the safe comes but possibly do the way, um, and and that that's something that we will begin to to address. We we haven't yet because. So much effort has gone into you know, the, the work to actually leave the EU and, and work our way uh, out, out of the work, as the committee well knows. Uh, and a lot of our time has been has been dealt or dealing with 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 all of that. But there will you know there, there will be areas that once we come out of transition, if we have the resource capacity available, uh, to look at whether there are you know areas of work that we have been doing. In the way that we have told us to do it for the last forty years, and there are some areas where there might be better ways of managing some of the challenges. So we we will be looking at those opportunities, but we haven't yet got got to do that. Okay. Uh, I mean, in terms of the the consultation, uh, I mean, I, I share the frustration uh, of Claire and others in that you know a, a large degree of this. I mean, it's a good consultation, and, and it certainly was well responded to from organisations and the public, uh, uh, and there's some really good answers, but it's not something, or there are issues that aren't new that, that we couldn't have predicted. Uh, I mean, I, I just uh, I'm a, have a bit of a concern in that, you know, it, it was clear before this consultation that the majority of people uh, here want an independent uh, EPA, that we want a Climate Act, uh, and I'm, I'm concerned that we are actually building... Uh, all of this wrong in, in the sense that, you know, the starting point for whether it's environmental strategies or green growth should be uh, a climate act. 
uh, uh, mirrored with uh, environmental protection legislation rather than the other way around. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's probably arguable if we had a different minister that rather than, uh, than tasking officials to do uh, consultations, they would actually be devising legislation to put these in, in place. And, and I understand that's not the fault of, of uh, civil servants. But I mean, it is the case that you know, a lot of these things are things that, that we have known and that we are kicking the can down the road. Yeah, no, I, I think when Claire made the same point, you know, she made the point that, that we're all aware of the challenges. Um, but I still think, you know, for a first ever environment strategy in Northern Ireland, it was important to go through a, you know, a, um, an appropriate, detailed public public discussion process. And um, you, you might you might suggest, well, did did you learn anything new from it? I suppose, you know, some of the issues that we did we did gain from it were were around the strong desire that it should be an executive door strategy, for example, something we might not have anticipated. Um, this government there. Um, so, like you know, you might be right. I mean, we, we we could maybe be working working ahead on some of the issues, and, and we have been. We, have, as I say, we've worked on an ammonia reduction plan that 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 will be soon. Um, we have worked on an air quality strategy that was to be um, launched this week, but it, it unfortunately had to be delayed for a number of reasons. But it will be launched very soon. So, we are working on a range of issues. Um, the minister has tasked us to to draft up. Um, draft legislation on climate change where and, and we have we we are, are discussing all of that with the minister at the moment so we we hope we will forward with climate change legislation uh, but not waiting until we have an environment strategy in place um so i i kind of understand the point but but it's not it's not that we haven't been doing things and you know, we have a whole a whole uh, range of, of measures that, that we are implementing as, as we speak, as I say, around ammonia, around climate change legislation. Um, we're working with all other departments on climate change mitigation measures, working with the um, Department for, for Economy on Energy, on their energy strategy, working with DFI on, on transportation initiatives that, that will, will help address climate change and some of the challenges. So we're, you know, whilst we prepared the first ever environment strategy and we had to pick a point in time, I suppose, to do it, <clears throat> at the same time, we are delivering on a whole range of other, other interventions and, and programmes. Um, when, when we have the, the environment strategy in place, that will just create a strong framework within which we continue to update those other sister strategies. Um, and you know, we'll, we'll move as quickly as we can on, on the environment strategy work. Talking there about ammonia. I mean, when are we going to see an ammonia strategy? I, I would hope within the coming couple of months. Um, it's it's a very complex issue. It, it's it, it's a challenging issue. It will be challenging for the industry. We, we need to work out how how we can support the industry to, to deal with it. Um, at the day we we have already, you know, we have recently launched a, a, a new tranche of F, our foreign business investment scheme. With environmental measures and, and, and support up there, including low emission spreading. We're we're encouraging low emission spreading. We're we're promoting that through the the education and communications around it. Um, but but we want to get to a point where we have a you know a formal reduction plan for Northern Ireland in place. And as I say, hopefully within within the next couple of months, uh, we 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 will be getting to that point. Okay, and, and after the production and publication of the strategy, I mean, will there be uh, engagement? I mean, there's obviously engagement within the sector now, but will there be a, a consultation process with regard to that strategy and all the other strategies that you are uh, looking at? Yeah, I suppose we. You know, uh, Claire mentioned again the, the issue of public participation. So you know, when as we draft the environment strategy, we we will be prepared, we will be talking to stakeholders and, and other other um, partners. Um, we will then go through a formal public consultation process on on the draft strategy, which hopefully after that can be launched. You know, but going forward uh, on issues like green growth, environment strategy, agricultural pressures, I, I think we see we recognise the need to have continued public participation on, on those issues. Uh, we just need to work out how, how we do that. Okay, thanks very much. Okay. Um, all right. Okay, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, David, Simon, Patricia and Aaron. David, um, good consultation there, I must admit 11 
interesting questions and definitely more interesting answers. I'll just go through a few maybe for wee points. Tourism, for instance, um, historic and heritage was mentioned. That's very good. Of course, I hope motor heritage is in there as well. And then transport, there was congestion mentioned, but there was one wee word mentioned that I thought, oops, and that was charges. Not sure how that would go down. Um, and energy, renewables should be affordable. I mean, I think that's a really good point. If we want things to be renewable, they really should be affordable. Yeah. At some time, the time taken to get renewables on the ground seemed to be an issue as well. I'll just go through them all if that's okay, and then it's easier when you're. And then <clears throat> there was another national parks. I know there's a lot of people, I mean, interested in these, but also know that landowners need to be on board. It can be a controversial one. Yeah. Um, energy sources easier to construct, that sort of follows on the other one. I thought it was a good one, reducing food waste, and that was at all stages. That's from production, consumption to disposal. So um, maybe a few wee comments on those, David, would appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, I mean, quite a, quite, quite a bit in there, but you mentioned tourism and the outdoors. And, and I think that there is that, you know, a healthy, attractive, beautiful environment does an awful lot to support tourism. Um, international visitors and, and you know visitors from closer to home so I, I suppose tourism's in there because of the potential that uh, you know a, a good clean environment offers uh, and also underpin the point of, of why it's important that we do what we can to, to protect our environment because there are lots of spin-off benefits that come from that um, you mentioned energy the energy strategy that's underway you know and a lot of potential there I think um, you mentioned renewables. We've already done extremely well in Northern Ireland in terms of renewable electricity. And I can't remember the figure. The, minute, the minister quotes a figure, but I think it's you know forty percent plus, maybe getting towards fifty percent. So actually, on renewable e electricity, we're doing really well. Um, but again, you know, a lot, a lot of potential to do more. Food waste, um, we've 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 made good progress on. So um, some of the regulations that came in over the last few years have encouraged householders you know to manage their food waste in a better way um, encouraging retail sector uh, and the hospitality okay. sector to manage food waste better and, and we have seen a, a, a you know a very significant reduction in food waste and from that you know yet you then have various other benefits in terms of reductions in greenhouse gases so i i mean i i, I think the environment strategy and the initiatives that we we, we will hopefully include in it create a whole range of opportunities um, for green jobs, potentially in, in the renewable sector, um, for tourism and, and those outdoor activities, um, which became you know, more important you know, on, under lockdown with, with COVID restrictions. And having beautiful places to visit was about the only thing that we had sometimes. So I think, I think all, of, all of the issues you've highlighted there underpin why it's important to, to have that a strong environment strategy in place with with you know good public participation, strong governance arrangements that hold hold, hold us all down in terms of what we're doing. Uh, and you know, we, we have an awful lot to do, I think, in terms of behavioural change right across Northern Ireland, both in, at individual level, but also, you know, for for sectors uh, where where we need to start doing things differently. And it's, it's it's not going to be an overnight solution, but hopefully the environment strategy will set a, a very clear direction in terms of where we need to go in Northern Ireland if, if we're serious about protecting our environment, our natural capital, uh, and you know the, the, the natural ecosystem benefits that all of that can provide. Because we need clean water, we need clean air, we need strong, you know, strong, healthy soils for agriculture. Uh, like all tells us an environment strategy is going to be a very important piece for Northern Ireland going forward. And those last points that you made there um, benefit health in general too, so it's very good. I'm looking forward, David, to the key themes and what the goals are too, so look forward to it. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. All right, all right. Um, William? Thank you, Mr Chairman, and uh, thank you for your presentation, even though I apologise I wasn't here in time to hear it all. I think in relation to our environmental strategy, I think it's vital that we get it right. I, I'm a farmer, I've been a, farmed all my life, so I, 
agriculture will play its part. I believe farmers want to help, they need guidance and financial help to, to try and change the way some things are done. Uh, and I know that uh, the, the new uh, scheme at the moment will ha help in some way to that regard. But I mean, I think we need to put things into perspective and be careful that we don't um, damage our own agriculture and at the same time the UK as a whole imports 40% of its food, import food from other regions that really does contribute to global warming. Like it. Our global warming contribution is so small, 0.04%. Yes, I don't say, I, I, I agree we need to do something, but I think we need to be realistic in what we do and sensible in what we do. And I think getting, a, getting this right and getting a balanced approach is very, very important. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, as I say, the Minister has put sustainability at the, at the heart of the Department's vision. I think that, that was a, an important, clear message that came from the Minister early on. Um, and I, you know, agriculture has, has, has very positive impacts on the environment, but it also has some negative. And I, I mean, I, I, now, I now think that, you know, from talking to our colleagues in, in the agricultural industry, there is a desire I think within the industry that as well as you know, keeping itself competitive, keeping itself profit profitable, that the industry begins to manage those negative impacts. Because I don't think I don't think they want to have negative impacts on the environment. I, I don't think they want to see negative impacts on water quality. Uh, and they want to work I, I think I believe they want to work with the department now, you know, where there are problems, address those problems and the department might have to help them do that. But if, if at the end of that we have a sustainable, profitable, competitive industry, I, I think it will have been well worthwhile. Um, and whilst Northern Ireland's contribution, William, to you know, greenhouse gas uh, challenges and climate change is, is a tiny contribution, I suppose, globally, um, nevertheless, you know, we, we, we want to do our bit. And when it comes to the other, other more specific environmental challenges around habitats, biodiversity, water quality, there, there are, I think, the industry through ways how, you know, through, through technology, through research, how, how farming is delivered that will reduce those negative impacts. And I think that would be a really, a really positive thing to do. Um, but, you know, through, through practical policy, we have to make sure at the same time that industry continues to be competitive with the competitors you, you, you refer to um, and profitable. And, and I think we need to try and get, as you say, achieve a balance and get those two things working together. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Uh, jo uh, John, John Blair. Uh, chair, yeah, can you? Yeah, we can hear you, John. I just frozen, John. Uh, I like while you apologize to our guests, I was late and, and missed the presentation, but I'll thank them for the report, which is very comprehensive, and I had read it in detail. A uh, couple of questions stemming from it, uh, chair, chair, which, which are firstly. On the issue of waste management, what can be done or what more can be done to achieve consistency across the council areas? For example, in my own area, which straddles uh, two former legacy council areas, it became perfectly clear to me that the triple stack system where recyclable waste was separated at the household was more successful in terms of recycling than the, the previous systems. So even in that one council area, there was and there still is to an extent two different systems operating. Some councils don't use that separation system at all. And I'm keen to know what more could be done to, to achieve that consistency and therefore get the results on it. The second question is around the um, environment strategy. I look forward to, to the further stages of it. But the bit that was missing for me, regrettably, even in the campaign res responses section around page 50, was, was the focus on how to involve the community uh, at, a, at a greater level. Uh, for example, I know that the, the department already does community outreach um, work in some of its business areas, and I'm not disputing for a moment the value of a departmental or agency uh, PR campaign in relation to the environment, but surely it is crucial to engage perhaps through arm's length bodies and councils, uh, community organisations, existing uh, environmental groups, volunteers who already do work on, on habitat restoration are, are, are a good example. Um, and I'm keen to know how we embrace the voluntary sector 
capacity that is already there, uh, bring it into to the work that's being done through the uh, environment strategy, and also uh, maximise, if possible, the engagement across the, the local areas. Yeah, okay, John. Well, again, I agree totally. We want to engage positively and comprehensively as we can. I'll bring Simon in in a moment just on that. He may want to say a bit more about what how, how we do that. Uh, I mean, we do we do work obviously very closely with the, the environmental NGO, so we do have a strong relationship with 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 those organisations. Uh, we work very closely with groups like Keep Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful, very very proactive, positive organisation, and we have a you know we, we work very closely with them. But I agree with you. If there's more we can do in terms of you know working with with local groups, community groups, who are already doing good things for the environment, then we should certainly be doing that. And if if we can build on that community involvement, I think it would be a good thing to do. And I'll let Simon come in in a moment if he, if he wants to add to that. On the waste, the waste point, John. I mean, um, I suppose that the, the approach we've had up to now is that we we're not directing councils about how they should deliver. We, we are setting clear goals in terms of what we want to achieve around recycling. And actually, Northern Ireland, as you, we've, done, we've done remarkably well. We're, I think our last figure was 52% or just below it of household waste recycled. The Minister is very keen that we push that up to um, a higher percentage. And we will be setting a, a target for that. Um, so we, we have done quite well. And, and despite the fact that there hasn't been you know, total consistency, um, we, we've done pretty well. Now, we, we have launched a, a household waste collaborative change program, which will run for a number of years. It's worth something like 23 million, I think. And councils can bid into that program to enhance their recycling facilities and enhance their approach to recycling. Uh, and, and we hope that that will create um, you know, an opportunity and a mechanism, maybe to get a bit more consistency. But it, it, it hasn't been our our. our uh, our role, I suppose, or our preference to direct councils absolutely in terms of how they how they do it. But we we are developing a you know a pretty pretty strong relationship now with councils. Uh, we we meet regularly with with them at a strategic level, uh, and those are the kind of issues that we can continue to discuss. I think with the chief executives uh, around you know, wh whether at some point there is merit in in Northern Ireland councils coming together in in a in a more consistent way. Um, and if, if that delivers better results, then it's certainly to be considering. Thank you. Do you want to say anything about that, that piece of public participation and working with local? Yeah, thanks, David. Um, you already mentioned Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful there. Um, oh, sorry, I can't hear David. Yeah, I can hear you. Oh, good. Um, the uh, department, of course, funds um, a large number of uh, third parties through its environment fund out of the revenue raised through the carrier bag levy. And uh, it's very much the case, you know, in the case of Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful, we've provided substantial funding, um, which involves very large numbers of volunteers, including uh, the Big Spring Cling, which is the largest volunteer event um, in Northern Ireland each year. Um, so it's very much something that we want to build on. We'll be making it a central theme of the strategy in the, the coming months um, in terms of community involvement. Uh, and indeed, the minister has made the point uh, that everyone, uh, individuals and communities have their part to play in this. Yeah, so John, I think, I think the point there is that, you know, that that's something that we will continue to focus on. Um, and as, as Simon says, you know, through the Environment Fund, we fund a, a lot of local groups and a lot of local initiatives, which are all very successful and, and, and deliver well. Um, and we'll, we'll want to continue to try and build on that. No, yes. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, okay, um, John. Claire, you're looking in for a question there? Thanks very much for letting me in again. I just wanted to follow up. I mean, you've talked about an awful lot of strategies that are being worked up. Um, at the minute, and that's great. And Philip asked specifically about the ammonia strategy that you said then is due for delivery within the next few months, and that you're working with this sector closely in how to deliver that. So, my question, I suppose, following on from that, is there any public participation going on with the development of these strategies currently? Um, well, we, we had a number of, of stakeholder events around, specifically around ammonia, where we had environmental NGOs in, in, we had Friends of the Earth at those meetings, we had the agricultural industry, 
And it was really through, through those stakeholder events we began to develop what we thought the most appropriate measures would be to help reduce ammonia uh, across Northern Ireland. So we're at a point where we we have a plan you know, of, of, of mitigation measures that we believe will help move Northern Ireland in a better direction in terms of ammonia and begin to reduce ammonia levels. And our plan is that we would go out to, to further public consultation on, on that plan, seek yeah. views from industry, seek views from the wider community and, and from NGOs. Um, no, I get that. That's not, um, you know, I feel that stakeholders are very different from public participation. So if we're trying to look forward to a public participation model um, and engagement, uh, is that anything that's being done at the minute or are we still stuck on sector and stakeholder engagement? Well, you know, we, we do need to talk to the stakeholders who have the, you know, yeah. the, the closest involvement and the closest interest. Yeah. Public, the public consultation process around it will, will be a full public consultation process. Uh, and we will use various measures that, that are available to help to help us reach out, uh, possibly in a better way than we have done in the past. And, and we put a lot a lot of effort into the environment strategy to do that. You know, and we had various public participation events. We worked very closely with youth groups to try and reach young people. And that was successful. We got, we got a very strong uh, response back from young people. Yeah, but I think the point David's trying to sort of look if, if we're going to try and do things differently or develop strategies and policies for the future to deal with all this, you know, where's the public engagement at the minute? You know, and, and are we going to do it in the same way as we have done before? Or what's the thing? You know, so these strategies are going to go hand in hand with, you know, delivering green growth, delivering environmental um, strategies, you know, potential climate change legislation coming um and the whole way forward post brexit as well so it's just i think you are we embedding new ways of engaging at the minute because these strategies will have longevity behind them i suppose on the environment strategy you know that that was possibly our first big attempt to uh, to to involve citizens and and, and get them participating better than they've done in the past and i think that was quite successful tracy will probably talk a bit a bit later about green growth and the plans for public participation around green growth and co-design of, of the measures that, that, that we're going to try to take forward. And I think that's becoming a part of how we consult nowadays going forward um, to try and, you know, try and tap in better to how, you know, how, how the wider community feel about initiatives and about strategies that we're, we're developing. So it, it won't be based on the old style public consultation where you know, a big paper goes out to a handful of stakeholders. It will be much broader than that, and I will try and make it participative. Okay, cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, um, John. Uh, Morris? Morris? Can you hear me, Morris? You're, you're, you're yeah. Me, Morris? yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. thanks very much, Chair. Uh, well, thank you very much for your presentation so far and your answer so far. Uh, but in terms of climate change, I think that Northern Ireland lads slightly behind, sat very, very sadly behind. And uh, as such, we need legal powers and enforcement going forward. Uh, I think we need a method of the polluter pays, not just for the damage he causes, but also for the, the cost of putting that damage right. But one of the things that I feel the department needs to concentrate on as a planning authority to ensure uh, joined up thinking through local councils and communities with clear direction when assessing applications to put the environment first. Are discussions taking place to address this? Um, yeah, so the, the, um, uh, I think called extended producer responsibility, which we're doing jointly across the UK, which, which is really about producers taking responsibility. Um, I suppose along the lines of, of polluter pays, but producers taking responsibility for what they produce and how the waste then needs to be managed and, and paying for that for the cost of that. So that, that that's a UK wide initiative and Ireland is part of that. We've been part of the early consultations and there are further consultations planned early next year. Um so yeah, we, we, we are we are taking forward some of that work, Morris. Um you you also mentioned climate change but us lagging behind. Um there is a private members bill I think, as you know, that, that that's being drafted. We we within the department at, at the minister's behest have also been drafting um, a consultation on on climate change legislation, and 
I think our feeling is that if we're going to do climate change legislation, we need to do it well. And I know there's a desire to do it quickly. And, and I think it's about trying to find a balance you know, where, where we do it as quickly as we can, but we do it comprehensively. We do it well and we do it in a way that reflects Northern Ireland's specific challenges. Um, so again, we are working on, 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 on that issue as well. I'm working on a range of other other environmental challenges and, and the various um, programs of work that are, that I've referred to. Um, Northern Ireland is actually doing better in some areas than than, than other parts of the UK. So we're we're, we're definitely not at, you know, the, uh, the bottom of the of the league table on everything on, on household waste recycling. We are doing better than a lot of other areas. Um, on water quality, we are doing better than some than, than other areas. But you know, it's 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 a continual challenge. I don't think we can we 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 want to leave it that way. We, you know, we we know we need to do better, um, and the environment strategy will set a framework and a context for helping us do that. The green group will set a really strong context for Northern Ireland going forward with, with a focus on green and a focus on green credentials, uh, and and you know, hopefully we we will if, if you think we're behind again, we'll we'll put ourselves up. Okay. Uh, just be you chair for last hour, just a wee question there. Uh, the consultation brings out a, a clear message that uh, not enough trees are being planted, nor are we putting enough uh, emphasis on wildlife and insects to keep them to the fore, particularly when planting uh, bee-friendly flowers and flower beds. I'm not being an advocate for insects, but they do feed uh, many bird species, something that was always, I think has always been overlooked uh, during planning applications and so on and so forth. Uh, What's the, the department uh, working closely with local councils to ensure that there's a greater planting schemes uh, being rolled out across the country? Um, not sure what we'll be doing with local councils, but you know, through, through things like the environment farming scheme, we've been working with farmers, we've been supporting farmers <clears throat> to do to do the kind of thing you've talked about, either create woodland or or create species rich grassland, you know, that, that will feed feed our bird population. Um, and and that, that scheme, the environment farming scheme, we're continuing to roll out. We've, we've had a recent tranche of take wasn't as high as we would have liked, but we'll continue to promote it. We're, we're planning a further tranche. Hopefully, if we, if we can um, get, get approvals to do that. We are working with the Forest Service in terms of afforestation, increasing afforestation in Northern Ireland. Forest Service within the department are working with councils and other public sector bodies around enhanced afforestation and woodland creation. Um, and I think through the Environment Fund that, that Simon mentioned earlier, you know, we, we offer support to local communities and councils around creating biodiversity schemes in their local areas, you know, which will which will enhance um, enhance the environment, but also provide you know that that species rich, you know, that, that will attract bees and attract birds and, and insects, as you say. So we we do we do already do quite a lot in that area, but you know if there are opportunities to do more, then hopefully through the consultation and the work on the environment strategy, we'll we'll capture where those opportunities are, um, and and we feel there there's merit in, in pursuing those further. We will. Okay. One final one, if that's yes. with your permission. Go ahead, Morris. That's it. In, re uh, in regards to ammonia. Uh, what technologies are emerging uh, to separate fluids from solids uh, in terms of ammonia being a byproduct of urine mixing with cow droppings? And yeah. could separation of fluids from solids reduce the amount of ammonia going into the ground? Yeah, I, th I think I think there are, there are lots of te technological opportunities uh, and solutions out there. Some of them still being tested. Uh, I, th I think what we've, you know, what is clear is that we, we need to embrace new technology as far as we can, because I think that that's likely to be part of the solution. Uh, but I, either either um, slurry separation type technology, but al also uh, you know developments in terms of animal feed, where through changes to animal feed content, you, you can reduce the ammonia that that's produced. Um, and I think there are, there are lots of opportunities like that um, where. We can help help the sector address the ammonia challenge. You know, using research, using new technology, using new food, animal feed diets, uh, using new technology like low emission spreading. Um, and, and there's a you know there's a there's a lot of stuff out there, more So we need, we need to investigate all of those. Um, and, and that's that's what we'll be we'll, we'll be trying to do. 
um, and hopefully the ammonia reduction plan that we're we're ho hopefully going to go to consultation on soon will begin. We will set out some of those opportunities. Okay, thank you. Bob. Okay, you chair. Thank you, Robin Morris. Uh, Rosemary, you're not yeah, right? thank you. Thank you for letting me in again, chair. It just um, you you mentioned Morris mentioned planning in relation to planning there. I think it's very important that there is consultation with planning, but at the present time, there is a huge problem with planning and agriculture. For example, I know a number of number of uh, agricultural businesses who have been building. They have been building more comfortable, safer, share, safer buildings for their animals and for themselves. That they're safer going into animals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. While the number of animals being put in the shed is not increasing, they they are having great difficulty getting planning permission, even though the number of animals are not increasing, because they want to build a safer shed, a safer building for these animals and for themselves. They're being turned down, and there seems to be a bit of a conflict there that needs to be sorted out. Um, there's that issue, and there's also the issue in relation to the keeping of hens. Uh, again, you have some some of these these people in the poultry in the poultry production, where they are actually moving from keeping hens in cages to having them free range, and there's difficulty there getting planning permission. Even though they're reducing the numbers, they still seem to. Not want them free range. Yeah. I said, well, look, that, that's it's not an easy an easy one to to, to address, uh, Rosemary, because there are a lot of complex issues in there. And you're right, councils are competent authorities under planning law. So when they make a planning decision, they're the competent authority and they're responsible for that decision. And they need to satisfy themselves that they're complying with all relevant uh, rules and, and pieces of legis environmental legislation. Which which they are doing, but on on some on some applications they remain concerned that in, in in the case, for example, where they're putting up a new a new house which might might help to reduce ammonia emissions, <clears throat> they need to take account of what the current position is. If the current operation is already you know vastly exceeding what is permitted, and and that that development will reduce that slightly. They may take the view, well, that's not enough because the damage being caused already is is far too far too excessive. Uh, and so there may be cases, and it all sounds odd, but but when an application for for a new house might put in place a more modern house, which would reduce the ammonia problem slightly, because it's still breaching the rules so far, you know, by by such an extreme, councils may find it still difficult to to grant a planning permission. And I think the solution is is through the work that we're going to do through ammonia mitigation, through an ammonia reduction plan, helping farmers manage ammonia levels on their farms uh, through the technology that we've talked about and, and different farming approaches. Um, but at the moment, I, 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 I agree there are some applications that are getting caught uh, and it's very frustrating for the farmer, probably costly for the farmer because of the, 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 the pet for planning consultants and pay for their, their application and so on. Uh, and the same applies on, on the, the example of the, the hen houses where you know some are moving to open uh, free range hens. Again, it depends on, on the individual circumstances of a planning application and what level of ammonia emissions is already being experienced. Uh, and, and what I'm gathering or what, what I'm picking up is that sometimes it's so high, even with a, a, a reduction, it, you know, it, it still remains too high. Uh, but that, that kind of takes us in Rosemary, to the whole area of planning, and it is complex, and it's by no means straightforward. But it's something we, that we're, we're very aware of, and we'll try to work with uh, the Department for Infrastructure and, Pl and Planning alongside our own work on ammonia reduction to try and find a solution to that. Thanks. Um, before I go on to Philip uh, for our question there, um, one of the things, uh, John, that... Um, I didn't really note it in great detail on the strategy was the, the fact that we share jurisdiction with the, the south of Ireland and obviously you know that these issues around environmental protection don't recognise any type of, of borders at all so what uh, level of engagement have you been having with the uh, 
your partners, your your sister or your relevant or relevant department in the in the in the south of Ireland. We we, we have good relationships with colleagues in the south. Um, you know, if, if you take, for example, our international water bodies, catchment areas, you know, they, they cross the, their, their trans boundary, they cross the border. And we've got very good cooperation in place with with uh, the South in terms of the mechanisms and the measures that are needed sometimes to address some of the water issues. On ammonia, we've been talking specifically with ROI colleagues about the ammonia challenges. They have challenges in the South. Our ammonia levels here, unfortunately, are higher. We, we've got a challenge to deal with, um, but we do we do work we do work closely with colleagues in the south on on the various measures that that, that, that we're jointly um, contemplating, um, and then you know the the issue of ammonia is a transboundary issue because we will have farms work working on the border area, and some of their ammonia problem um, affecting a designated site beside them might be coming from across the border, um, it's damaging the site in the north. Um, they they will do what they can on their farm to reduce the ammonia levels, but it might not actually be enough to protect that designated site because some of the harm is coming from across the border, and the same will work the other way on, on occasion. So, transboundary issues something that we really deal with, um, and I think you know the, the 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 continued engagement with colleagues in the site is important, um, and it'll be important to, to manage those transboundary issues, but sometimes they will be difficult. Manage. Thought you're looking at for. A... Uh, thanks, Chair, for that man again. Uh, I mean, lo a lot of these issues that we're talking about are, are, are obviously com complex and have competing narratives, and, and we have to kind of uh, sort out uh, issues in maybe a, a progressive manner. I mean, and this is maybe not at the same level, obviously, as climate change and all of those things. But it's really frustrating. Uh, it raises all the time the level of. Blight happen and littering uh, that we see here. Now, um, my political perspective doesn't normally allow me supporting uh, heavy law and order or enforcement, but I mean, there must be something that we can do. I mean, obviously, it's a cultural issue that I just can't fathom why people would throw litter, either in small amounts or, or large amounts. But what, I mean, in terms of the strategy, can we produce a strategy that's actually going to be effective and tackle this issue? I'll, I'll let Sam come in, so, you know, just in case there's something specific around that. But look, I, I, I feel I, I agree with you. Waste crime, not just in Northern Ireland, but right across the UK and other regions and, and in the South, waste crime. Um, and there are, unfortunately, individuals out there who will either attempt to save money by simply dumping their waste uh, or, or will try and make money out of it by, by, doing, you know, by charging people to take their waste away and then dump it. <laughs> So that, that unfortunately is something that that with um, on fly tipping specifically, and I work closely with councils in terms of uh, the responsibility for for clearing up fly tipping when it happens. Uh, and I think by and large we, we you know we, we try to do that as well as we can. You, you will get the audit key when something goes wrong, something is missed, and it becomes a bigger problem. But by and large, I think councils and and NI work work pretty well together on that. Um, I'm not sure, Simon, if, if, if tipping has come up specifically as an issue under the environment strategy discussion process or whether we have given any particular thought around whether or not that's that's a theme that we could maybe try to, to consider within the context of the environment strategy. The issue specifically of lettering was uh, quite a common thing that came up in the responses to the discussion document. And it is very much an area that we expect um, to focus on within the strategy as we draft it. Uh, my team has specific responsibility for uh, legislation in relation to littering. And the last big piece of legislation on this issue was the Clean Neighbourhoods and Environment Act in 2011. Um, so it's a, an area that we do need to uh, look at and update. We are currently conducting a review of the fixed penalty notices, uh, which councils can issue uh, fines of up to £80 for littering. Um, we currently, of course, have a marine litter strategy, but we don't have a terrestrial litter strategy. Um, so that's very much uh, an area we expect to be expanding on um, in the environment strategy, and we'll be including the outcome of the review of the fixed penalty notices 
Um, so, for example, the penalty available in Northern Ireland, as I say, is up to £80, but more recent legislation in England allows fines of up to £150. Okay, thanks, Sam. So it is something we will look at within the context of the strategy. Going forward. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, the chairs went out, so I'm taking over chair in the meeting. William, you're next. Uh, just a quick, uh, in relation to planning, and uh, David will be aware of this, I'm sure, but I mean, there's many farm buildings that were built in the 70s that are probably at the end of life. If those farms are not allowed to modernise and replace those old buildings, it will have ramifications for the future of agriculture, in that the next generation of young people coming on won't be able to stay on the farm. So I think this must be addressed, whereby in many cases, as has already been mentioned, there are no increases in ammonia levels. There's a modernisation of that particular yard to try and continue. Uh, and I think, I suppose, again, it's down to the, getting a strategy in place that allows this to happen, because I think this is vital for the future. If, uh, if we don't let this happen, it will have ramifications for the next generation of farmers. Yeah, well, I, I agree, I agree with him. So, as you say, we, we, we both know that there's a, a, a very difficult problem at the moment. And I agree with you, if, if, if farmers are not able to up, update and, and modernise those farm buildings, that will have an impact on the farm's viability. So I think it is, I agree with you, it's something that we need we need to work out, we need to find a solution to this. Um, and I think the solution is somewhere in, in, in how our ammonia reduction strategy, if, if it's ambitious enough, can then allow greater greater <clears throat> latitude and discretion and discretion in terms of how we apply um, the, the environmental rules within the planning system and we need, we, we need to find a way of, of getting to a point where farm buildings can be modernised both because that will help reduce ammonia emissions and because it's, it's important for the farm viability um, and, and that's the kind of that, well that's the work William that we've been work, working on as you know for, for some time now um, and hopefully we're getting closer to a point where we, we will go to consultation on a set of proposals that will begin to move in a better direction and all of that. But I, I, I totally recognise it's a, it's a problem at the minute. Um, and the Minister, I think, recognises it too. And you know, the Minister is very keen to find a solution to this. And we, we'll, we'll be meeting with him again to, to discuss just how we, how we take all of that forward. OK, thank you. OK, thanks. I think that's all the questions for David. Uh, Tracy, you've been sitting very patiently, so we're, we're going to move uh, <laughs> to yourself. Thank you, Philip. Fighting it very hard not to chip in there, but uh, I'm here today actually to talk about green growth. So thank you for the opportunity to brief the committee. Um, first and foremost, uh, committee, I would say that we're at the start of this green growth journey. And a lot of what you'll hear today will be a reflection of the thinking to date, the ideas and the opportunities and the challenges that we've identified. I do hope that you will clearly see the link with the environment strategy that David has updated you on because the environment strategy will be one of the key strategies that sits at the heart of this green growth framework. And it will set the tone uh, in terms of environmental protection and improvements that we're looking for in the next de few decades. So following initial engagement with his executive colleagues, you'll know that Minister Putz launched green growth as a concept in a statement to the Assembly on the 23rd of June. And since then, in the past uh, three or four months, officials have progressed work in this area mainly through extensive engagement with NICES colleagues, particularly in the economy and infrastructure departments, and with a very broad range of external stakeholders from the business sector, environment sector, and local government. And this has been the start of what we call our co-design process for developing the strategy. We don't have all the answers, that's for sure. The expertise lies in many other areas, and without doubt, a collaborative approach is going to be needed for the Green Growth uh, Framework to be successful. So today's meeting with the committee is an opportune time for us to bring you up to speed um, on where we're at, but also at this early stage on the process to seek your views on how green growth as the concept, the strategy and the de delivery framework are all shaped. So I will do a bit of recapping in terms of the rationale for the approach that has been taken um, and outline uh, the, the plans for the co-design and the delivery framework. So in terms of the rationale, you'll probably find that I'm, I'm commenting quite a bit or reiterating quite a bit of what um, David has said, but there are clearly a number of drivers at play. Um, so the UK government is committed to achieving net zero carbon by 2050, which means a radical change of context for our economy towards a more economically and environmentally sustainable model. 
uh, based on innovation and recognising the true value of the environment and the development of our people so that they can drive this new economy. And climate change has demonstrated beyond all doubt that our environment and our economy and our society are entirely interdependent. So effectively tackling the major challenge it presents can't be addressed in isolation through a raft of disparate strategies and plans. Uh, and I think, you know, I just wanted to say that that's a, a lesson reinforced by, by our recent experience dealing with COVID. Um, we, we definitely emerged stronger when we worked together. So the Green Growth Strategy will be the Northern Ireland's executive's approach to recognising this interdependency. It will ensure collaborative action. It will optimise our efforts and minimise the risk of unintended consequences. So aligned with the programme for government and the new decade, new approach commitments, the aim for this is that this will provide a route map to ensure that we work together to value our assets, our environmental assets, grow those assets, and in doing so, grow our economy. So we, we have a big ambition here. We have a big aim. Um, it's, broader that, it's broader than uh, just the net zero target. We are talking about protecting and enhancing our environment, delivering sustainable economic growth, and also the society uh, will benefit from those outcomes. So how are we going to do this? Um, we've got a, a two key elements to the green growth approach. A strategy that extends to 2050, but will include immediate, medium and long-term actions. And a delivery framework that includes a series of foundation programmes and partnership agreements to create momentum and hopefully deliver the necessary change. We're very keen, committed at this stage, to actually demonstrate strategy and action on the ground. So we see these elements running in parallel. So the, the, in terms of the co-design, um, I'm just going to give you a feel for what we've, what we've been dealing with in terms of feedback from our stakeholder engagement. So we've said it will require collaboration across the executive uh, stakeholders um, beyond local government and, and certainly very much within the business and foundry community sectors. So we've been engaging with all of those, seeking their views on the, the need for this green growth approach, how they think it should be developed, um, opportunities to make an impact on our climate, what should we be doing to improve the economy while considering the, the balance of the economy and the environment? It's been very well received so far from all the stakeholders. Um, we're also establishing a number of stakeholder groups who will be invited to continue to work with us on this co-design. And I've given you an example of that or a diagram in your briefing papers. Um, and in some ways, I hope that this will show the public participation that's very clearly needed. You'll see that we've set up a series of uh, mechanisms, one of which is the green growth community, which definitely, in terms of what Claire was talking about, is very much in that public participation arena. So we know who we, we know at this stage pretty much you know, the big players who we want to involve in the co-design process. They range from the business sector, foundry community sector, academics, UFU, the NGOs. And to give you a sense of some of the feedback that, that we have been um, provided with, um, they say we need to build relationships with key delivery partners. We must create a level of awareness and understanding and enthusiasm for green growth. We must, working with others, identify and de develop the opportunities and ideas. We should identify those measures which offer most opportunity towards achieving net zero. We must reassure both environmental and business interests of the shared goals and ambitions. And we must encourage policy areas across the NICS to integrate green growth thinking into future policy. And there must be investment in this ambitious but much needed plan. I would say, you know, I, you know, if I was to say one of the key messages that has come through, green growth provides an opportunity to join the dots that has been in some ways a bit of a gap or missing um, in, the, in the past. We'll also be looking in terms of this co-design process as well as all of those stakeholder views and bringing together the right people. We'll also be looking at best practice, best practice elsewhere and lessons learned. So in parallel to that then, we've also started work on the delivery framework. And this will consist of a range of programmes which together will contribute to cross-cutting targets and outcomes. It will be a mix of policies and strategies and on-the-ground plans of action. So key strategies will include the one that David's just outlined, the environment strategy. And you can see how ambitious that is and, and the, the, the scope within the environment strategy. We've also got the economy strategy, the transport and the energy strategy, and we've began our conversations with those departments in terms of how this all will come together and fit. But using all of these policies and strategies, the aim is, and, and to coin a phrase that somebody said, um, they will walk us from where we are today to where we want to be. Um, and, and we do have, in terms of key themes emerging, agriculture, transport, energy, waste management and business. Um, and again, that's in your briefing pack. But to start the process, 
we identified those themes to start to, to take us forward. Um, we've also then made a start through the development of foundation programmes, the first of which you'll be aware of is our Forest for Our Future, which the Minister launched. Um, and as you know, that's 18 million trees by 2030. And it is a mix of matching uh, the economy and the environment. It will create uh, jobs. I think in somewhere in the region, the forest sector, forestry sector, there's a thousand rural jobs. Um, and also from timber production, it's something around 60 million pounds per annum. So that's, you know, trying to get these links to join up both the economy and the environment. In addition, to help shape the delivery framework going for forward, uh, Minister Putz has wrote recently to his executive colleagues requesting their assistance to scope indicative proposals for new or enhanced interventions, along with broad estimates of the costs and benefits in terms of greenhouse gas mitigations and the economic growth potential, and we're waiting on those returns coming in. So hopefully I've articulated the vision of what we're trying to do. We have an overarching strategy, and then that will be underpinned and supported by a delivery framework on the ground. And it is 30 years, so we, you know, just to recognise that this isn't um, an overnight success, this is going to take some time. And then having provided you with the outline of how it's shaping up, it's probably worth mentioning two other important elements, metrics and governance. So the impact of green growth, the, the strategy itself and its aim and objectives um, and the elements within it, they all need to be monitored and evaluated and reported on over time so that success can be measured and corrective action taken where necessary. And in particular, it will be important to establish baselines. At this stage of the process, carbon emissions, it's been decided, will be used as the primary measure um, for poor productivity, environmental damage and health risks. But this is, so this will allow us to prioritise those actions that best reduce emissions and promote productivity, environmental enhancement and health and wellbeing. And we've touched on some of those in the session with David. So importantly, while carbon will be the primary proxy measure, other measures will still be used within each theme and to monitor each element of the delivery framework and the strategy's progress generally. So that's not to say that we'll be measuring carbon, but not measuring water quality and not measuring biodiversity improvement. Um, and I just want to be really clear on that, that it's not seen um, solely through that lens. Um, and that means we'll also be looking at the environmental indicators set out in the programme for government and the commitments contained within New Decade, New Approach. So we actually, to take this forward, we've set up a green growth metrics strand of the project. Uh, and we've got interest from you know, external scientific and academic organisations, including AFBE and Queen's, who are keen to offer support in this arena. And then in governance, just to, again, just to keep everybody um, abreast of what's happening, um, we're definitely applying best practice in terms of how we're taking this forward. Um, we've got governance structures agreed and with steps taken to implement uh, a few of the initial priority uh, governance arrangements that we need. So firstly, in line with this commitment in the statement to the Assembly, our Minister has written to Minister Dodds, Mallon, Minister Murphy and Minister Nikulahan to invite them to join a Green Growth Interministerial Group and a date has been agreed for that meeting later this month. And together those Ministers will help steer this agenda in terms of green growth for the Executive and green growth for the people of Northern Ireland. And then secondly, there's also a Green Growth Strategic Oversight Group and the role of this group is to preside, provide oversight of and input into the strategy design phase of our work. And this will be comprised of senior reps from the business areas within DERA and across other departments. Uh, and they will ensure that this will be you know, an integrated, well-communicated and well-developed strategy. And it will include subject matter experts. So Chair, I'd finally like to paint a picture of what sort of lies ahead and the priority work of the division. Um, so over the next six months, the focus will be firmly on progressing the co-design of the strategy and the framework. We're actively building expertise in our, what is a very small team, but a very significant piece of work. Following the feedback from the engagement to date, we're currently taking a stock take of all of that information, insights and the views received. We're finalising the formation of the various stakeholder groups that we will be involved in in the co-design. And we'll also be establishing a range of mechanisms which allow businesses and organisations to demonstrate their commitment to the green growth aim and to be recognised for doing so. We have a huge amount of interest in this. Um, and of course, we, you know, we want to engage with the committee further as the process develops. We want to ensure you're cited on the progress. However, very importantly, I would like to take this opportunity today to ask for your early views on the approach and the development of the green growth strategy and what you've heard today in terms of how we're going to take forward the delivery framework. And just one, one sort of point that I, I probably would have to highlight is that in all of this, we're very conscious of the competing priorities that exist across the NICS, not least the challenges ahead concerning EU transition and COVID-19. 
We're also conscious of the important role green growth will have in helping us to achieve the fundamental change required in our society over the next 30 years. So it is crucial that we plan this process properly and engage people effectively and seek the appropriate support. And at the minute, that's exactly what we intend to do. Um, so it's a, it, is a, it is a challenge. Um, it's very uh, overarching for the executive. It's bringing everything together. Some people have used the term the wrapper, um, the, the piece of work that will join all the dots. Um, and thank you, Chair, for the opportunity to make these opening remarks. And myself and Aaron, who's the programme director, are more than happy to receive your feedback and to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Tracy, for that uh, fulsome uh, overview uh, of, of where, where we're at. I mean, I'm just if I could start off probably making the same comments that, that I made to David. I mean, the green growth is, uh, is obviously well supported uh, and it's obviously vitally important uh, to our business and our community that we do plan ahead uh, and that there's some kind of certainty for businesses in, in, the, in the future development. The point I made to David, I'm going to make to yourself. You know, it seems to me that it, even with this green growth, it would have been better that it sat under the umbrella of, of a climate act that, that give uh, industry and, and sectors certainty with regard to t targets for c carbon reduction. So, I mean, I'm not saying it's not good that we're working and, and progressing with green uh, a green growth strategy. I think it would have been better. Uh, sitting underneath the Climate Act uh, and, and allowing certainty. In terms of uh, the community participation, Tracy, I mean, you, you, you talked about the groups uh, involved. I mean, you didn't mention trade unions. Uh, I think it would be important uh, that uh, I mean, trade unions and workers are, are included at every step of the way and that just transition principles are, are followed. Uh, so that we're not leaving people behind and that we're not uh, sort of disbanding people or know that people have certainty and feel part of the process and, and engaged mm -hmm. in the process. And then just finally, the last point, uh, I mean, obviously it's 20 or 30 years of a strategy uh, and you outline some of the work that's, that's going on ahead. Uh, but in terms of a, a timetable for the actual strategy, when do you, I mean, do you envisage this up and running in this mandate, for example, or when can we see uh, yeah. certain in that? Yeah, okay, so I'll, I'll address those three points there, Philip, and I'll take your point on the, the point you raised earlier about the Climate Change Act, and I've noted that, you know, in terms of the order that we're doing this in. Um, however, you know, we're still committed to this, and, and a lot of it aligns with the same overall target of net zero by 2050. Um, on the unions, um, again, um, I think I, I wouldn't be convinced that we have the unions uh, noted as one of our key stakeholder groups. So I'll pick that up, Philip, as an action point to make sure that that's checked. The, the unions will be certainly part of that green growth community that we we've flagged. Um, and finally, then on the timelines, um, initially, you'll see that um, we had a target to have a draft strategy out um, by March 2021. Um, at this stage, I would say, just with the wealth of information coming in, um, the wealth of uh, input into the beginning of the co-design process, and some people being tied up on the EU transition um, and COVID, the aim certainly will be to, to work towards that. But at this stage, I definitely have, I would be pretty confident that this will be in this current mandate, Philip. Okay, thanks very much, Tracy. Okay, Philip. Um, Patsy? Patsy? I'm online here now, Chair. Yeah. Well, I wanted to establish was just, um, we've we heard um, all this stuff in the past about Green Deal, and it's good to see the department focusing on that. But it was, I was listening there carefully to what Tracy said about um, working with other government departments, and I'm specifically interested in the economic benefits of Green Deal and green opportunities. So I would like to hear if, um, in liaisons and, and uh, working with the Department for the Economy specifically, and maybe even more specifically invest in I, if at this stage, well, there's plenty of opportunities, if at this stage, formal opportunities are being uh, explored, um, as I would anticipate they should be. Yeah, Patsy, absolutely. We have met so far with Invest NI and both with the Department for Economy. Um, and and they both, set, both quite different meetings, I have to say, in terms of what we covered, but similar issues. Um, and with Invest NI, we were talking around how we will engage businesses on this in terms of um, the focus of environment in their business plans and also looking ahead to the potential for green jobs um, as we change, you know, maybe some of the direction of travel in areas such as 
hydrogen. Um, now, when it comes to economy um, and both the energy and economy and, and the, the economy division itself, um, you can see that the energy they're already working towards their strategy, they're developing their energy strategy out to 2050, and we're engaged with them in, in that area. Um, they also will be members of the strategic oversight group, so we're trying again, as I said, to join up the dots there. Um, on the economy side, you'll appreciate that Department for Economy have a lot of issues to deal with right now, um, and our conversations have been in and around, you know, they've got immediate pressures in terms of the economy as a result of COVID-19, but they're completely wedded to the future that we're trying to articulate, Patsy, in terms of the longer term and in terms of green jobs. So yes, the early conversations, and that's what I'm saying, we're at the early stage of this, but those two parties that you've mentioned, yes, we've, we're already in the engagement with those. That's okay. And are they, if I could just follow up, are they, what kind of feedback are they making into the overall strategy? What sort of involvement are they in developing, helping strategically to develop uh, yeah. the strategy? They'll be brought around. So this is early engagement. They will be brought into, you'll see there, there's a, a green growth forum. Um, yeah. So you, we, around that table, we're going to have a strategic oversight group, and that is senior representatives at grade three level, so deputy perm sec, Patsy, um, somebody covering economy, somebody covering transport, somebody covering energy, somebody covering agriculture, those themes that I talked about. So they will be members of a strategic oversight group. And then underneath that, there's going to be a green growth um, forum, uh, which again will be subject matter experts, uh, and that will include the likes of Invest NI. So they are all going to be invited, if not already, well, some of them are already invited into that uh, structure that we've put in place to design the strategy. Okay. Ms. Grant, thanks very much for that. Thank you. Thank you, Patsy. Thank you, Tracy. Claire? Thanks, Chair. So, I'm hijacked there by my cat, sorry. <laughs> uh, just on the back of that, can I have a, a, a potentially a quick request? Is it possible for the committee to have uh, a details or lists of who is being engaged at what level? You know, Tracy's made mention now that the big players are involved in the co-design and that there's other engagement with stakeholders and that there's moves hopefully to do public participation with all this as well. Um, is that something that we could request? Yeah, you want the detail? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I'll quote okay. Aaron because I think we already have identified the majority of these. Aaron, can you give the, because we've, I know, Claire, there's a huge amount of people yeah. uh, banging at the door to be involved in this. Yeah. And our, yeah. our biggest challenge at the minute is managing that and managing it through a virtual uh, room. Um, but that's our plan. So Aaron might have, uh, I think we, we would have everybody identified more or less, Aaron. The big one is the green growth community. It could be um, one that we just need to be careful how we manage it, but a very important one, Claire, um, because this, this is public participation, as I see it, is what you've been asking for. Yeah. Um, Aaron, do you want to come in? Aaron, you're muted, I think. Oh, you can't hear Aaron, Claire, can you? But that, no, can't. But listen, but it's I, rather, yeah, I'll take it forward. Minute, actually, yeah. at the minute, is it possible for the committee to have those details forwarded on? I don't see a problem with it as long as the, the people themselves are involved or no. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. And listen, then I wanted to ask again, so we have the environment strategy. We've just gone through that. We're looking at the green growth again. And you've already said, you know, carbon being um, used as the, the main upfront um, output measure. Um, but I know that you've acknowledged that other measures um, will be there as well. And, you know, particularly in terms of the green growth, um, I think that's really, really important. And I want to come back to that sort of environmental enhancement and uh, levels of monitoring that's being thought of here as well. So in terms of measuring if carbon is out front and centre, um, what kind of baselines will be used? Because we know, for example, air quality is, not, you know, the carbon's not just the only factor there in terms of the pollution um, in polluting our waterways. It's not necessarily carbon that's that as well. So we have the other one. So what... What will we use and as the, the baseline for that environmental enhancement to be coming forward? Yeah, so and I suppose and I'm asking that again, you know, in the context of the um, environment bill going through Westminster, where we didn't have those baselines set and it's not Northern Ireland specific and we're being left in this legislative void. Um, so if the strategy is coming up, what are we using there as baselines and how are we going to measure enhancement? Yeah, and, and Claire, that's, going to, that's why we've identified a, a work stream. Um, in some ways, we want one version of the truth in terms of what the baseline is and then what we're trying to get to. Um, so we've set up a, a particular work strand to look at that um, and develop the metrics. 
Um, so we do have information in terms of water quality. We do have development underway on the programme for government indicators. So all of those will all have to be captured, Claire, and not all of them will be owned by DERA. Um, a number of these uh, measurements will be owned by others in terms of, for example, the transport and the energy. Um, so there's a bit of work to be done on that uh, in terms of baselining, and that's why we've set about a particular uh, work strand to do that, to baseline everything. Where are we starting from and where do we want to get to? Uh, the overarching one's easy to do because you can sit and say you want net zero by 2050, but those other ones in terms of biodiversity, um, water quality, I mean, our water quality, as you know, is sitting at 36, 37 percent. Um, and, you know, previously with an EU target to reach 70 percent. Um, and then we've got P and N, you know, issues that David has mentioned. So I still think there's a bit of work to be done in terms of setting those uh, targets, which is back to what David was saying earlier in terms of the environment strategy. But this will all have to tie in. So I, I'm afraid I, I can't give you the exact answers right now um, because there's more work to be done in terms of what those targets will be. Okay, um, I'm going to declare my interest. I'm I'm lobbying for net zero by 2045. By the way, <laughs> so, so, some some people are lobbying for 2040, so don't be worried. <laughs> but listen, just in terms, of, so those baselines. I mean, that, that does concern me, and I'll put it out there that because we don't have a legislative framework, and any legislation that we do have in terms of environmental measures or outputs, we are in breach of quite a few of them. Um, so without that legal framework, you know, then if we don't have that backed up with, you know, setting those baselines, um, I think that we're just, you know, yeah. on a trajectory that we shouldn't be on, really. Um, and we're starting from a very low baseline because of the damage and the environmental context that we are sitting in, particularly with biodiversity and pollution in particular. Um, so how will how will so that's baseline. How will it be monitored? What's the conversations? What's the thinking behind how this is going to be monitored? To them. Well, we, we have yeah. So it's, it's early. Sorry, go ahead, Claire. No, actually, go ahead. Sorry. No, it's it's early days, Claire, because we don't actually have the strategy developed, um, but we are already thinking about the fact that this will need careful monitoring. So we've got an interministerial group, you know, which we will be discussing with them on at the end of this month in terms of the overall. Uh, ambition um, and then sitting underneath that we will have set these sister strategies as we call them and we'll need to align and say what is the target that's being set down in the economy what's being set down in transport what's being set down in terms of the future agricultural policy um, and, and then the monitoring will actually take place through that strategic oversight group that's going to be steering the whole of the framework and some people you know I've heard the comments saying the green growth framework should really keep us you know, keep us on our toes, keep us monitoring, keep us making sure that we're doing the right thing, heading towards these targets. Um, so that is all clear to be developed, but that's our thinking at the minute. And that's why the governance arrangements have been established pretty early on in this, in terms of that oversight group. Okay, so again, I'm, in my head is the going for growth strategy. So that strategy was rolled out and delivered, but had no environmental impact assessment carried out. So in in if we're not looking at baselines yet, if that's an ongoing conversation, if you know current monitoring has shown us that where we are in breach, but yet action's not being taken there either. So all that's under development. Will this strategy have an environmental impact assessment carried out? Could that be used as something to then build from and setting those moving forward? Well, certainly we'll, we'll, we'll look at that, Claire. Absolutely, we'll have a look at that. Um, at this stage, as I say, we're... We're thinking all of those things through. You know, we do want to monitor each element of that delivery framework that I had talked about. You know, say, for example, even the Forest for the Future as a foundation programme, there's monitoring already built into that. Um, so there's a, there there's, has to be a mechanism to capture all of that and then to monitor this throughout. Um, I do think just, you know, you're thinking, this is what we need, this is what we want to hear from you today. You know, what are the important things that we need to be building into this whole process? Um, we don't want to miss anything. This is if it's going to be 30 years in the making, we want it to be well developed, well monitored, well executed, um, and that's the plan, Claire. So I'm afraid, you know, in terms of not answering some of your questions, it's because we're still thinking those things through. Okay, thanks. Well, that's my suggestion: is that both the environment strategy and the green growth strategy um, are both environmentally assessed um, in terms of their impact before we go anywhere with them. Thanks. Yeah. No. Thanks, Claire. John, are you John? You're next on the list. Are you online, John? Can you hear us, John Blair? 
he, I know he's having connection problems there. But, so we'll move around to, to William and maybe come back to John again. William? Thank you, Mr Chairman, and thank Tacey for her presentation. Uh, I think green growth strategy is very important for the future. I mean, we have, uh, I'm just looking here at, you know, the, the, the agri-food industry is worth 49.9 billion in sales. Uh, it creates up to 100,000 jobs. Like, the, the future is vital. I think we're the envy of many across Europe. Uh, we have a very thriving agri-food sector. Um, will, we know that the environmental, environment strategy that David talked about earlier, the green growth strategy will probably have to work in tandem with that. Would I be right in saying that? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. William, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and, and the agri foods that you mentioned there. So, you know, in terms of Dara and our colleagues, one of the themes will be the agri food um, as a particular theme. Um, and we're working with our food and farming group colleagues on that. Uh, and obviously, it's linked to the future agricultural policy uh, and looking at how to, you know, the, the issues that we mentioned earlier in terms of sustainability going forward. Um, uh, you know, so it's it's very much joined up, um, very much aligned, uh, and it's that balance between protecting the environment and ensuring that growth can still happen. Yeah, I mean that that, that, is, that is vital for the future, and, and getting there is a, the big task. I understand that. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll be looking at those issues. You know, I, I'm not going to take away from what Food and Farming Group and Dara will be do, but will be doing. But certainly, our conversations with them will have been along the lines of you know technology in the future. You know what will they be doing differently? How to you know in terms of you know better ed, you know educating farmers, giving them time and giving them you know help to get there. Yeah. Um, so that's the type of conversation William we're having. That's good. Thank you. Um, thank you, William, and thank you, Tracy. Um, John, can you are you back in there, John? John Blair? No. No. Uh, we'll go move down to. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Um, we we'll ask a question. Uh, on behalf of John, um, because it's connection, John's asked the question: Is the delivery plan going to have a time frame? The delivery plan is actually, um, in some ways, chair the delivery plans kicked off. Um, you know, the strategy has a timeline that we certainly want to develop a strategy and get it out in this mandate. The delivery uh, framework is happening as we're speaking. In some respects, because um, you know, while it's not fully articulated, we we're not letting the grass grow under us in terms of if there's something that we can do, we will do it, and that's the likes of the forest for our future. So it's already kicked off, and um, we're also taking work forward in terms of um, what are being called, you know, green growth agreements. Companies and firms coming to us saying we want to work with you, and to give you a flavour of this, you know, we, we've been talking to Tourism NI, the National Trust, CBI, um, Belfast Harbour Commission. You know, the, the amount of people that are engaged in this process is quite significant. Um, and what we're, we're aiming to do is, is develop some pilot work with them in terms of the de delivery framework. So I think the delivery framework is actually kicked off. Um, we mightn't have it um, nicely uh, worded just yet in a narrative, Chair, but um, we will do um, over the next coming months. But uh, it's, it's already in action. Um, jo John is also asking the question, can the, the community strand uh, include schools, local enterprise agencies, community organisations, in addition to Invest NA? Yeah, I, again, um, well, we're doing some work in that area. Um, the community strand, I, I think, is he talking about the green growth community? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Certainly, we, we look at that, John, in terms of making sure that that list is complete and wide ranging. Okay. I uh, thank you. Um, Morris? Morris? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it could be a little so far. But my mind is along the same theme as John, I suppose, really. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we live in a, in a throwaway society. Uh, a caring society, mm -hmm. I, I might add, uh, there needs to be a massive education in terms of green growth. And there are no greater educators, in my opinion, than children. Children educate adults. I remember when my twin grandchildren were of an age when they sat in the back of the car, they sent her steady to me that I had the seatbelt on. So the fact is that I now use the seatbelt all the time. So uh, does the department, I suppose, and I'd like to ask, does the department intend to engage with the education system to highlight and encourage greater participation on protecting the environment, reducing waste, 
through our schools and our school children. Yeah, and, and Morris, we already do a bit of that through the eco schools. You know, there's already a programme in place um, and that's very successful. Um, so we're not going to drop that. If anything, we'll be building on that because that's a, a great success story. And in terms of the green growth itself, we had already identified um, with Aaron and the team that we would be doing uh, more work in terms of the young people. Because when you think about it, <clears throat> you know, this is a 30 year strategy. And, you know, I hope you don't mind me saying, but, you know, we're, we're sitting here at a certain age developing a strategy, which actually is the strategy for, um, dare I say it, my children and grandchildren. Um, so it's really important that we engage the young people in it. And, you know, I've read as well the, the piece of work that Simon did on the environment strategy, and there was a lot of engagement with the young people. So that information will also feed into the green growth framework as we develop it. But more specifically, we are on the green growth engaging with the, the young people, the young, the young citizens, as, as we've identified them as. And the eco schools is, is actually very good in terms of what it does. Yeah. I hope yeah. that answers your question. It does indeed. Thanks very much, Tracy. There's no, no better future than the children themselves. Thank you. Um, Rosemary? Yeah. Tracy, thank you very much. Tracy, I'm just wondering what engagement you've had with councils, and with um, you know, our district councils. I know we've spoke, we, there's been engagement in relation to obviously the waste strategy, but I'm wondering what engagement you've, other, other engagement you've had with them. Yeah. Yeah, um, the two, um, there's two councils specifically. We, early on, Rosemary, we um, brought together a, a reference group um, and we had Belfast City Council Chief Executive Suzanne Wiley at that and also representative from Derry and Straban. And that was to get the early thinking, Rosemary, in terms of what the councils were doing. Um, and as you know, different councils are at different stages in terms of um, where they're de delivering in this, but it clearly links into their local development plans. It clearly links into their um, oh gosh, the cities, city deals. Um, so there's a lot of there's a lot of linkages there. And even more recently, you know, I had a, a more detailed conversation with Belfast City Centre. So um, I think the councils are are pretty engaged on this. The ones that we've dealt with, but they are identified that we will be dealing with all councils as we go forward, Rosemary. But I have to say, at the start, we had more specific contact with um, the two the two bigger councils. Uh -huh. Yeah, because I'm thinking. This, this is a green, green growth strategy, and those are city areas. I think perhaps maybe a little bit more engagement yeah. in the rural. I, uh, with absolutely. The, with the rural yeah. councils. And um, one, one other thing, if, if I may ask, um, that is, how, have you made any steps or what way are you looking at trying to identify and secure funding to establish programmes programs of work for the future? Oh, that's in the pipeline, Rosemary. Yeah. Um, and, and Minister Murphy's invited to the inter interministerial group meeting. Um, so early, dis you know, early discussions only on that one, Rosemary. But that, that certainly, you know, this will have to have a, this will have a cost to it. There's money attached. Um, now, obviously, own departments will already have bid for their own uh, pieces of work. You know, should it be energy or transport or agriculture for that matter? Um, so that all needs to be um, identified and then considered in the rounds in terms of maybe maybe there's a different way to do this in terms of a funding approach going forward. But that's fairly fairly early in the process, Rosemary, in terms of discussions on that. OK, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Claire, you're looking back in. Claire? Um, yeah, can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, Claire. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Tris just wanted to follow up on one of the things we're talking about there. I'm, I'm thinking, where where do the department see the sustainable economic growth within this strategy, um, and what areas do you think will be required to focus on a degrowth model? Uh, I, I suppose in some ways, Claire, where the minister has, has um, written out to all the departments to actually ask, you know, what are the big initiatives that you're taking forward? that will contribute to uh, net zero and what are the other benefits that they will bring about. Um, and I think we do need to do that bit of exercise to actually scale, you know, to sort of look and say what is happening across the, across the board, you know, what's happening that actually might um, take us in a new direction for Northern Ireland, you know, will energy be our next thing, will tourism, you know, we did the whole staycation, you know, is there a different way to do that? So I think there's a bit of work to be done to land, you know, look at that sort of landscape term um, and then see, you know, where do we put the main emphasis and the main focus on? Um, and it's not, you know, economy will be looking at the green jobs, um, but it's not only economy. You know, as I mentioned earlier, there's 
There's jobs in forestry, you know, in terms of, um, you know, the forest for our future. There's rural jobs to be thought about. Um, so again, there's a, there's a, when we get all of that in from all of the departments, we will have to look at that and say, right, what is this? What, what, what way is this going to take us in terms of sustainable growth? Um, and again, that's all part of this co-design process. We need to get all the information in, uh, analyze it and assess it and, and consider what way it will shape up um, for policies and strategies going forward. Okay, I, mean, I, can, yeah, I can give my view, but you know, I, I wouldn't have the full information. Yeah, no, that's okay. But is there an acknowledgement that some areas will have to be on a degrowth model? I, I don't think that that particular conversation, those words haven't actually been, you know, um, used yet, Claire. Um, okay. So I, I, I don't know whether there'll be a natural, you know, that will happen naturally in some areas, maybe just because of the situation we're in. Um, and we have to think differently and we have to, you know, think that for Northern Ireland, we just have to change our uh, unique selling point, as somebody said to me recently, you know, maybe maybe we market ourselves different. So, you know, those words haven't, degrowth haven't actually been used, to be honest, um, in the conversation so far, but it's early days. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Um, and just see before we finish off on the question here, um, um, see, in terms of involving uh, children and young people, I just think that's crucial. And I just know from my own work at community level, at home, uh, where we um, manage an ASSA as part of a community facility, that it's children, not only is it about their future, but it's also, they can also come up with some of the best ideas, provided that they're involved in the consultation process, uh, but also trying to reach out to them in uh, a medium that they understand through art or through competitions or whatever. Has the department thought of any novel ways or, or ways of trying to involve children in, 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 de in the development of the strategy through schools or whatever, through, um, is there any sort of mediums that they would have or any yeah. creative ideas that they would have to involve children in this process? Yeah, Chair, um, I know that the Department on the Environment Strategy um, did use the lyric um, and did plays for, for the children. I'm sure Simon's probably a better place to, to talk about that than me, but as far as I understand, that was a, a great success in, in terms of reaching out. So we'll take the lessons for that forward into green growth. Um, but yeah, we have looked at innovative ways of, of doing that. Um, Simon, did we do that? Isn't it the lyric we used? Bring Simon in. Yeah, I can yeah. come in. Yes, Tracy, the, the, um, the lyric was, I think, on the specific issue of single-use plastics um, uh, with the EPD's work there. Um, we, in terms of the strategy itself, um, looked at various events with Ulster Wildlife and Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful and Eco Schools. Indeed, when we launched the public discussion document, we worked with Ulster Wildlife, Keep Northern Ireland Beautiful and the Belfast Hills Partnership to do a litter pick in North Belfast, just in the hills north of Belfast, and the minister attended with the BBC. So very much uh, large groups of uh, children involved there, uh, students, pupils, clearing up litter. Um, and uh, yes, it was a very successful event, um, which got uh, pretty good media coverage as well. So, so Chair, we'll, we'll pick up on those lessons that have been used by others in terms of engaging with the, the young people. I suppose the other thing I would maybe mention is, I don't know whether anybody's tuned in to my NI. Um, we have another way of um, giving out the message and through social media. Um, and we've done some great work through my NI in terms of, particularly during the COVID period, in terms of looking out and watching, you know, your nature and the litter and all of that, all of those good, that good uh, information that went on during the, the summer months. Um, you know, protect, you know, if you're out on a staycation, protect the nature. So we will be using, we've already had discussions with using that social media um, to deliver messages around green growth. Um, and we, we do know that young people are more inclined to follow the social media. Um, so yeah, we, we, we look a wee bit further at that, Chair, just in terms of the, the points that everybody nearly has raised there around making sure that we engage uh, children and young people in this process. And just being uh, completely unrelated, I know that the topic of uh, farming has been raised here on a number of occasions in terms of emissions. But will the future environment strategy and the green growth strategy, will it recognise that the CO2 emissions that are emitted as a consequence of farming and food production are part of a cyclical, a biological cyclical process, uh, which involves the sequestration of CO2 back into the environment 
and through the land which the farmers uh, who maintain in a way that maximises the sequestration as part of that cyclical biological process. Yeah, uh, I know. Um, you know that's that's definitely within the, the arena of the future agricultural policy chair, um, and we're feeding in through through that sort of mechanism um, to make sure that that's captured in terms of the carbon sequestration. So there is a bit of work underway in that, um, certainly with our science colleagues in the department. So yeah, that's being factored in. Okay, thank you very much. I thank the officials for your attendance this morning. It was a, a good session with a lot of questions and a lot of very detailed answers. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, thank you. Thank you now. Take care. We're going to move in now to um, item five here on the agenda. It's um, the Greenhouse Oral Evidence Greenhouse Gas Emissions Trading Scheme. Uh, I want to refer members to the briefing from the clerk at page 83 to 85 and corresponds to the department at 86 to 89. And members will be aware that this SA forms part of the ETS common framework that we, um, that we have been considering. Uh, we have John Mills, Richard Coy, and Hugh McGinn on Starleaf. You are very welcome. And I'd like to uh, invite you to um, brief the committee and then the committee members will then ask some questions of you. So, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, can I just check that members can uh, hear and see me okay? Yeah. Great. Okay. As uh, committee members will be well aware, as part of leaving the, the EU at the end of the uh, implementation period, the UK will cease to participate in the EU Emissions Trading Scheme, or EU ETS, so I shall refer to it. GB installations and non-generators in Northern Ireland will join either the UK ETS or be subject to a carbon tax. The legislation to put those in place, the UK ETS, was debated and affirmed by the Assembly on the 3rd of November and committee members were prominent in that debate. Unlike the order to establish the UK ETS, which was debated and which was made under the Climate Change Act 2008, the regulations before the committee now, the Greenhouse Gas Emissions Trading Scheme Withdrawal Agreement EU Exit Regulations 2020, are made under the Withdrawal Act. In that sense, they are standard Withdrawal Act regulations. That is, they are being made on our behalf in Parliament for reasons of efficiency, like other withdrawal SIs, statutory instruments. The Department for Enterprise and Industrial Strategy, BEZ, Ministers have asked for uh, the DERA Minister's consent to lay this negative resolution statutory instrument in Parliament as it affects devolved matters. As part of the clearance process, the Minister is seeking the Committee's views before responding. The regulations implement elements of the withdrawal agreement, including the Northern Ireland Protocol. From a Northern Ireland perspective, the main impact of the regulations is to preserve the uh, single electricity market by implementing the protocols requirement for Northern Ireland electricity generators to remain in the EU ETS. This ensures that there is no distortion of the single electricity market uh, due to differential carbon pricing uh, north and south. The regulations cover a number of other issues besides the protocol requirement for Northern Ireland electricity generators to remain in the EU ETS. These concern the winding up of UK installations participation in the EU ETS. They ensure that UK operators continue to comply with their compliance op obligations on emissions for the 2020 year on reporting, verification and so on during 2021, by which time obviously uh, they will have left the EU ETS. They also provide for the continuance of the UK's international reporting obligations under the Kyoto Protocol on Climate Change. This fulfills obligations under Article 96 of the Withdrawal Agreement. These provisions are not relevant to the Northern Ireland uh, electricity generators who will remain in the EU ETS, but are relevant to Northern Ireland non-generators, just as they are to GB participants. In terms of impacts on business, the uh, statutory instrument is, or the regulations are intended to ensure 
that the move across on 1 January 2021 has no material effect. In particular, Northern Ireland electricity generators will continue to participate in the EU ETS just as they do at the moment. Should there be any unforeseen or unintended consequences, the government will look at ways of addressing these uh, to eliminate any impact. As the regulations do not add or reduce costs on business to a material extent, theirs have not carried out a full impact assessment. As I've said, the main effect, uh, as far as uh, Northern Ireland is concerned, is to keep things the same for electricity generators. The future for non-generators has been subject to debate in the Assembly recently, and uh, the, uh, as a result of uh, the debate uh, establishing the UK ETS. Regardless of the UK government opting for a carbon tax or the UK ETS, Northern Ireland's five electricity generators will remain in the EU ETS with these regulations, thus maintaining the single electricity mar market. That concludes my remarks, Chair. Thank you, uh, John. Um, before I, um, I bring in Claire, who's in the kitchen, wants to ask a question. Uh, one of the things that we had raised at, uh, whenever this was brought before the committee uh, previously, was um, was there any local impact, local impact assessment carried out? And it had been indicated to us that would be provided before the debate in the chamber, which it wasn't. So, is there any assessment at all about any about the local potential local impact uh, on industry here, businesses here? Uh, there was a local impact um, uh, carried out uh, assessment carried out for uh, the. Um, for the UK ETS, um, I thought that had reached the committee before the debate. Um, would need to check that. Um, there's no um, well that, that that assessment does um, uh, refer to the fact that uh, electricity generators will be uh, staying with the EU ETS, but there's no specific local. Um, uh, impact assessment on this uh, regulation because the impact is to keep things the same. So there is no impact. Okay. Uh, and are you 100% uh, certain that given the fact that the, the UK ETS uh, has a slightly more stringent cap than the EU one that that wouldn't result in carbon leakage at all on the island? Um, Will there be no carbon leakage? No, I, I, I can't be I can't be one hundred percent certain because we can't see the future. That, but the um, I can see no obvious reason why uh, that the particular um, uh, the the UK ETS uh, would result in carbon leakage uh, for a, for a start off. This regulation, which deals with the electricity generators, account for 80% uh, of our uh, emissions and, and more than 80% of the costs. So there's no change for them. Um, and on the, the, that industry that is going to go, hopefully, into the UK ETS, uh, it is designed to make a smooth transition with the maintenance of the same number of free allowances uh, that uh, installations would have received under the EU ETS. So uh, even though uh, there is a 5% um, uh, uh, re reduction in the, in the total allowances available, that is uh, very hard to, or I find it hard to see the circumstances in which uh, that would uh, result in uh, carbon leakage have to say that the commitment on that side uh, on the UK ETS, not the regulations we're talking about today, is the, uh, that there will be a review of uh, the level of allowances um, uh, by the uh, Committee on Climate Change in light of their six carbon budget or in interim uh, targets and, uh, and and they will look at what the level of ambition will need to be um, in the UK ETS to uh, match up 
to the net zero target. So uh, we, we, we do have to see how that review goes uh, in the future. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, John. I'm going to move to Claire, who's indicated. Do you want to ask a question? Thank you, Chair, and thanks very much, John, for that. Can I just double check? That, did you just confirm there that the carbon tax, if it is introduced, um, won't affect Northern Ireland? So even if you know we're doing the ETS scheme at the minute, but if Westminster move in the future then to a carbon tax model that doesn't affect Northern Ireland? Uh, won't affect the, um, the electricity generators who will remain in the EU ETS as a, as a result of the... Uh, Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, if there was a carbon tax, though, it would affect our non-generators, our uh, 16 uh, non-generators. Uh, there wouldn't be a UK ETS, and, and so for them to join, which is the plan at the moment, uh, so they would be caught by the carbon tax, yes, if that happened. Either either long term, permanently, or, or uh, for a short period, depending what the UK government decide. Okay, thanks for that. That just came up. But it was a, the um, committee on climate change I wanted to ask. Has the department um, had any official communications with the committee on this scheme? Um, and is there any anything here that you do foresee? So obviously they're going to come up with a review and the sixth review coming at the minute. So do you foresee that there will be any significant difference between what the climate change committee are recommending and the current cap level that we're coming to? Um, I, I, I think my, my answer to that is generally I, I don't know. Uh, the, 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 the Climate Change Committee has, uh, as, as I'm sure you, you will be well aware, uh, does these interim carbon budgets and it hasn't, it hasn't done an interim carbon budget when the net zero target has been in place. So first of all, we need to see what it's uh, what what the committee on climate change recommends overall uh, in terms of its if these interim steps in light of uh, the the net zero um, uh, target and then secondly um, w as part of that overall package uh, the committee on climate change will look at what the ambition needs to be in um, in 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 terms of a UK emissions trading scheme uh, to hit net zero. And the general feeling would be that the current cap of 5% below EU levels wouldn't be ambitious enough uh, to meet uh, net zero targets. But the, the trouble we're trying to predict that is, you know, in terms of government policy, you could always go um, heavier on another sector and lighter on um, the, the EU ETS, but if, if you if you if you're not as hard on the, on pushing the EU ETS, some other sector, transport or agriculture or wherever, has to make up for that. If you're going to hit the net zero target. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Okay. So um, I want to thank uh, John and Richard and Hugh for attending this morning. Uh, our, our, afternoon now we're straddled into this afternoon so um so remember it's content that we note this essay uh as the previous great words as the great words the formula of words is previously agreed great okay thank you item six on the agenda is the uh, ornamental horticulture industry regulations uh, the memo from the clerk at 91-92, the draft SR 93-100, the explanatory memorandum 101-103, and the SL5 at 104-105. The SL1 was uh, was concerted by the committee on the 1st of October. Members queried the requirement for businesses to be VAT registered in order to be eligible to apply to the scheme. Members will be aware that the requirement was subsequently removed and the committee considered the amended SR on the 8th of October, which states the members indicated they were content with the policy. Marriage the policy. The report from the Examiner of Statute Rules, which has been uh, rules which has been tabled, advises that regulations were made on the 13th of October, laid on the 14th of October, and come into operation on the 14th of October. The department acknowledged. Uh, that the explanatory referendum to the regulations, that the regulations were laid in breach of the 21-day rule, and apologised and explained the reason for the breach. 
department advises the, the, the department advises the department for the breach necessary, given the urgent need to provide financial assistance as soon as possible. The ESR is content the department has on this occasion provided a satisfactory reason for the breach, which has occurred in the context of the department's urgent response to the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Um, remember, members, any comments on this scheme? Um, Okay. Um, are we content that we put the question in the Committee for Agriculture, Environment, Rural Affairs, Concerned SR 2020 2019, the Ornamental Horticulture Industry Coronavirus Finance Assistance Scheme regulations? And there's no objection to the rule? Great. Right. Great. Okay. Uh, item 7, uh, SL1 Organic uh, Produce Regulations 2020. Uh, the memos are page 107 to 110, the SL1 is 111 to 114, the draft SR is 120, 115 to 126, <coughs> and the explanatory mem refer memorandum and equality based screening really needs an impact assessment at 127 to 157. The SSR is subject to negative resolution procedure and will be laid in the Assembly later this month, and the amendments made by the SR will come into operation on implementation completion day. The SR does not amend existing policy and fees. These are already in place uh, across the UK via the Organic uh, Product Regulations uh, 2009. Following transition period, um, SI 2098-42 will only apply to England, Scotland and Wales. Therefore, the Department uh, states it is necessary to replicate the Organic Products Regulation 2009 to provide powers appropriate for the administration and for the EU legislation in the North as part of the Northern Ireland Protocol. As the regulations do not make any changes to the current strategy requirements, the Department did not carry out a public consultation. Our officials engaged with the Belfast City Council as well as the Department of Justice and the Department of Finance. Both departments give uh, permission in relation to fees, offences and penalties. Um, um, you know, so there are um, there are officials in standby if you want anything clarified in this or are members okay with it or? Okay. 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 Are members content that SL1 moves to the next. This SL1 moves to the next stage. Okay. Okay. Item eight, eight on the agenda: genetically modified uh, organism EU exit regulation 2002. Um, the uh, there's a there's a memo from Stella at 169 to 171. The SL1s 172 to 174, and the draft SRs 175 to one. Uh, on page 175. The SR is subject to a negative resolution procedure and uh, the amendments by the SR will come into operation on implementation period completion day. The purpose of the SR is to implement EU legislation listed in the North in relation to genetically modified organism by resolving operab operability issues. No consultations were carried out in respect of this as dear believe that does not introduce any new policy. Um, okay. So um, one of the things I will say is that DERA are suggesting that it will also be possible that the North is no longer a member state to apply to uh, DERA to market GMOs solely here in the North. Um, should we get some written information in relation to this aspect? For example, on what systems procedures would be in place to allow DERA to decide that a GMO could be marketed here? Written up to that okay? Sure. Yeah? I, is there not a strong lobby within the UK to progress more freedom for the use of GMOs now? You know, there's quite a strong lobby, and I think we need to maybe get a bit of clarification on that. I want to bring in, there's, we have got um, Ken Bradley, Paul Devine, and Mark Preston. Why don't we want to bring them in maybe to clarify something? Else? Okay. Can Ken, Ken, Paul, and Mark, can you hear us there? Yes, Chair, I hear you. Yeah. I'm here. Rose, we just want to raise that. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Uh, there's, is there a case where the UK could diverge away from the EU? Thinking, because there's a strong lobby within the UK who's wishing to progress, free, more freedom for the use of GMOs. Uh, well, it evolved. Uh, GB could after uh, exit day, after the transition period, uh, diverge from the current EU policy, Northern Ireland cannot, because of the, obviously because of the protocol. Now, I, I'm not sure um, what uh, interest or it is for introducing GMO crops in the UK. The most recent um, 
actually was the uh, EU approved eight different varieties of maize crop to be uh, grown in the EU, but all uh, all parts of the UK and Ireland uh, opted out uh, of that and have no intention of uh, growing maize. Though in, in actual respect, maize wouldn't be commercially viable here. It, it just wouldn't grow here. Yeah. So th there is no um, um, stance as I know or understand that uh, the GB or UK is pro uh, GM. DEFRA, probably uh, as the most uh, liberal stance, they said any decision on GMO crops or otherwise would be based on, on the science. And as yet, there is, there, is no, uh, there is no approved crops or anything that is uh, viable in, in the UK or Ireland. Okay, Rosemary. Yeah. So, are we content that this uh, LCL one moves to the next legislative stage? Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. No, item nine: the SL one um, pesticides and invasive alien species regulations. Right. Uh, Twenty. The memo, the SL one, and the draft SR are at page one seventy nine to one eighty four in the packs. The SR is subject to a negative resolution and will be laid in the Assembly and the amendments made by the SR will come into operation on implementation period completion day. The purpose of the SR is to implement EU legislation listed in the NA protocol in relation to pesticides and invasive alien species for resolving operability issues. No consultation is carried out as uh, Deere believes that no policy changes. Um, members okay with this or do any queries? Okay. Okay. okay, I'll be moving this one to the next stage. Okay. Written briefing, uh, further LCM and medical and uh, medical medicines and medical devices bill. Uh, again, th this is um, correspondence, the LCM, and correspondence from the, the health minister to the chair of the committee. They're all contained at pages 186 to 199 in your packs. The committee considered this LCM uh, on the 11th. June 2020, and subsequently received the agreement of the Assembly on the 16th of June. On the 22nd of October, the Executive agreed that a further LCM is now required to take account of recent uh, UK Government amendments to the Bill, and they're detailed in 189-195 and be laid in the, the, in the Assembly by the Department of Health. May I ask to consider and provide his views on the memorandum respect to the amendments relating to the veterinary medicines, as outlined in your packs. And, um, the health, the health Committee is also considering the memorandum insofar as relevant to uh, human, human medicines. Um, members, have any comments or anything that they want to raise in respect to this from here? There's a number of amendments, so it's better to take them in order. Yeah. Um, I uh, just want to look into it in the back there. I, it's, I think that the key amendment is creating a medical devices information system. Um, that that's the, the key the key amendment to this one here. Um, were to improve the I I sort of either to take action in the event of a recall or identify devices that are implanted in in patients. Um, Strengthen the legal basis for sharing information internationally. I think that's the, the, the purpose of it. So, um, are, are members content that we write to Health Committee outlining our consideration of this? Mm -hmm. Or do I bring any officials to any questions you have? No? Okay. So, are members content that the letter is cleared by correspondence due to the need to respond before the committee meets again next week? Yeah. Enough. Yeah, sure. Sorry, John. Yeah. Well, John, sorry, I missed your hand up there. Yes, go, John. Apologies. Uh, on point seven of the report, if we go back to it here, yeah. there's the um, uh, issue of regulations um, which might be made, including the manufacturing, marketing, supply, and field trials. Um, I may know there'll be a fair uh, amount of uh, technical information required in relation to this. Could we also seek? Um, <clears throat> Uh, assurances that there be no delay in implementing any procedures that need to be put in place prior to um, or or immediately after, for that matter, January twenty one. Yeah, 
Uh, well, there's, um, we have a number of uh, officials here on, on standby. Do any of you want to uh, pick up on that query from John, Naomi, Francis, or Alistair? Uh, Chair, perhaps I can just shed some light. So th this, this bill is currently, as you know, making its way through um, Parliament. Um, the intention is um, that the bill will, it's an enabling bill, which, you know, as you know, confers radiation making powers. And the intention is that it should be in place um, in time for the end of the EU transit, you know, and transition period. So it's currently making its way through the Lords and will shortly progress to Lords. Um, to further stage in the Lords, and it is it's intended it'll be in place by the end of the transition period. I don't know if that helps. No, it's okay. Okay. Um, Naomi, okay. just when you're when you're online there, one of the things I did notice in the pack was that I said it would make it easier, and it's just probably more relevant to um, human residents and uh, as opposed to the veterinary, make it easier to take action in the event of a recall, identify uh, devices in each patient. See, in terms of, uh, and again, is to facilitate the ability to interact with international healthcare partners. Um, see that the, the, the data on individual. Will, will this all conform to the GTP ER rules and you know, the what? data on individual people? Okay, well, I can't, I can't comment on the on the sort of the relevance to medical devices, um, Chair, but um, I can tell you that um, the power or, or the provisions in the bill that strengthen. Um, the powers to disclose information internationally, they provide that those powers cannot be exercised uh, where that would contravene data protection issues, where, where it would contravene data protection law. So there's a provision in the bill that says that, it, that the bill doesn't authorise any disclosure which contravenes data protection. Perfect. Thank you, Naomi. That was the answer to the query that I had. So thank you very much. Um, item 11 on the, uh, the pack today is a, um, a written briefing uh, from the monthly COVID update. It's at page 201 to 214. Um, I want to draw members' attention to page 202 in the section update on secondary legislation. This refers to a significant volume of best hours required for EU exit. Um, can I ask that we get uh, urgent clarifications and defa details on this, please? Members content to note. Okay. okay. Item 12 on the agenda is the uh, Air Quality um, Regulation 2020. The, there's a memo from Stella, correspondence from the department, and a written briefing from the department at pages 20, 216 to 225 in the pack. The SA has been classified as a Category 2 by DERA. The committee is asked to indicate if we are content for DERA ministry to give consent for the UK Minister to lay a statutory instrument in the Westminster on the Air Quality uh, Regulations 2020. The Committee is asked to direct any comments or issues it wishes to draw to the attention of the Minister. This, reg this statutory instrument amends the Air Quality Miscellaneous Amendment and Revocation of the <coughs> End EU Legislation EU Acted Regulations 2018 and the Air Quality Amendment of Domestic Regulations EU Exit Regulations 2019. The Department states that these amendments ensure that the UK meets its obligations under the protocol in respect of the products covered by the volatile organic compounds and paint directives and, uh, and activities that come within the Industrial Emissions Directive in relation to the generation, transmission, distribution and supply of electricity trading and wholesale electricity or cross-border exchanges in electricity. Um, do you remember any questions on this one here? Content for to move on to the next stage. Happy enough with the agreed form of wording. Mm -hmm. okay, thank you. Um, in terms of correspondence, uh, correspondence at two thirty to three eighty seven. Are we happy to? Uh, are members happy to act in the correspondence suggested in the index sheet? Okay. And in fourteen. Yeah. Okay. Happy enough. The forward work program. Uh, it's at pages 389 to 290 pages. Okay. Um, can I ask members to note that next week we'll be getting a briefing uh, on the future agriculture policy, including direct payments. Can suggest also, folks, that we ask the UFU to present to us on what it considers a future agriculture <coughs> policy be like. We can also get uh, a, a written briefing from NIAPLA on this as well. Two key stakeholders. 
Okay. Um, as this is likely to be an area of big area of work for the committee to the end of the month, I seek agreement for the communications office to draft a press release uh, following on the future agriculture policy briefing. So the committee can sign off on next week's meeting. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. Are we happy enough with the forward work program? We agree to. Yeah. Um, do members uh, um, have any um, other items of business they wish to raise? Yeah. Yes, Rosemary? Yeah. Uh, it was just this morning, I think, yesterday evening, a bit concerned in relation to a statement put out by the software company in relation to the software being available for the ports. Right. Um, when, when we transition out of the EU. Uh huh. And we would more that, information you, about that. Is, that, is this the DIR ICT system or yes, the DIR ICT? DIR ICT. It seemed to be the DIR ICT system. Yeah. yeah. Could you check up? Have a. Can I ask that? Yeah. I, I can. I, I thought officials had told us that they were well in advance. And that yes. After they're here. You did you hear the same? Hmm? You heard the same this morning. Yep. Yeah. I heard it. I recall from the briefing last week, isn't the DIR ICT system to integrate with the Traces NT system? There's so there's, sure. is there some, there obviously is some, yeah. that's something that's urgent I've, because I've, that's I've important just, for the... I've just pulled it up, so is that the agency sector management one? Yeah. It's on the BBC website, so we haven't looked at that. That's important for the seamless three at East West. At West mm -hmm. Yeah. Up. I mean, it was just, just the same point. I, I wasn't sure now, but because I, I heard it in the radio this morning, I was on the phone call, so uh, I wasn't sure whether it was the HMRC or, or the DIRA system, but the software for whichever system it is, they were saying uh, it wouldn't be ready until April. Yep. So, I mean, yeah. I, 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 I didn't pick it up either. Is it GVMS, is it? The right. HMRC system? Well, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I got it. So either way, I think it's important that we, we get some clarity on yeah. it. Highly does a concern. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, then, uh, is that okay? Can I? Sorry, sir. Um, we got briefing on that. I mean, I have it in my head. Sorry, I might have got this wrong, though. From the officials that um, the IT system, they were saying that the IT systems wouldn't be ready, wouldn't be in place, and it would probably be up to six months before they were ready to go. I, that, that, that's the HMRC one, isn't it? Yeah. That's the HMRC one. Oh, There's a number of different systems at play. There's the, it's the DIR ICT one, the Traces NT, and the HMRC one, which is, which is called GVMS, I think. So it's, it's, a, it's a bit convoluted. So it would be great if we could get some clarity from the department on unravel of it and see where we're all at. Would that be fair enough? Yep. Okay. Um, okay, members. Uh, so the date and time of the next meeting uh, is next Thursday, the 19th of November. 10 a.m. and 9.30 here in Parliament. So, um, we're going to go into closed session here now. Thank you, folks. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.